All right, welcome everyone. <clears throat> We're gonna get started here. We've got a pretty full afternoon and I'll just uh, sort of look over to you for the next couple minutes to make sure <laughs> sound volumes and everything are all right. And uh, as my voice continues to wane, you can just increase the volume perhaps, you know, so keep me going until it peters out completely. And then I'm gonna get, I think you said your name was Brian. Yeah, he's gonna take over if I have to leave because I lose my, yeah, just kidding, Brian. <laughs> All right, well, my name is Tim Kearns and uh, I'm with the Great Lakes Observing System and very excited to have all of you here today. Thank you for coming. Uh, where's David? Are we doing on, like, are there people online already? All right, how many? All right, we've got, 900 people online, I think he said, <laughs> in addition to you in the room. So this is pretty wild. Um, it's kind of amazing that we're here. It was weird and great all at the same time getting on an airplane. I know many of you have traveled a lot over the last couple of years, but for me personally, it was the first. And uh, I know for some of you, it was also the first time. So it's kind of nice marks, maybe a shift in where we are. Um, and, uh, and it's just great to be here and a fantastic setting as well. So as you know, this event today, Building the Great Map, it's part of Glossapalooza, which is a week-long series of events uh, hosted by the Great Lakes Observing System that includes the IUSE Code Sprint, which is concurrently running right now. It's a Monday to Thursday Code Sprint hackathon type thing. We've got developers and technologists digging into all kinds of amazing technical challenges and problems and coming up with new solutions. And that's happening at the Pendry Hotel and it's been a great success so far. It's also, uh, Glossapalooza also includes a board meeting for Gloss, but as well the um, Gloss annual meeting, which is the last little while has been virtual or non-existent. So it's nice to have that in person as well. We've got even more people coming in tomorrow for that event. Uh, and then we'll also be launching Seagull, which is our marine IoT technology platform we've been building for the last couple of years. And we'll be launching that tomorrow afternoon and then having a party tomorrow night. So if you're able to stay for any of that stuff, then we welcome you. And, um, and it's, been a, it's been a good week so far. This event specifically is Building the Great Map. It's hosted in part by Northwestern Michigan College, our partner uh, in Lake Bed 2030. And I mean, if you're, you're all familiar with Lake Bed 2030, you may not be, this is initi it's an initiative that was spawned back in 2018, I think, at a Marine Technology Society and Northwestern Michigan College Tech Surge. And, uh, and Lake Bed 2030 was sort of co-opted from the Seabed 2030 uh, initiative that was happening around the same time. And it's really grown from there. And it's really, this event is a part of that larger initiative. Lake Bed 2030 is not something that anyone owns and, uh, but everyone can be a part of it. It's kind of a great thing. Uh, so then just to give you a quick sense for how how Lake Bed 2030 has grown and what mapping in the Great Lakes means. I was attending a series of meetings last week in Monaco, not um, personally, although maybe in hindsight, because I had to stay awake for three nights in a row, which was a terrible idea. But there was these meetings event in, in Monaco last week and the head of marine policy for the UN Decade of Ocean Science was talking about how bathymetry globally was becoming more mainstream and becoming part of the observation community. And it was referenced that at the, I forget the name of it, but the conference in Hawaii a couple of years ago where there was a special section on Seabed 2030 at an OBS event was a big deal that there was a focus on bathymetry. And actually he threw up a couple of acronyms on us there, the Great Lakes, or, well, the Great Lakes Observing System was on there as well as the Global Observing System, just sort of acknowledging that, that observing systems around the world are taking rec taking notice that bathymetry is a foundational data set and needs to be included. And then the secretary general of the International Hydrographic Organization leans over, like I'm just a virtual and I'm a nobody, right? And I, he leans over at the table and he's like, yeah, and I understand that next week there's an event in Chicago about mapping in the Great Lakes. <laughs> it was pretty wild, you know, like this is happening and we didn't, we're not, we didn't do big promotion on this. This is just our little group. So it was pretty wild and uh, felt really good to know that what we're doing here with Lake Bed 2030 is gaining real traction and people internationally are recognizing what we're doing. The Great Lakes may not be salt water, but they're still large bodies of water and they still need to be mapped at high resolution, which is what today is all about. I did want to call it the Chicago Yacht Club. Um, and what a 
phenomenal venue that we have here today. And uh, just a little shout out to my colleague, Lyndon, who, who helped get us here. We were scouting locations of where to have this event as part of Glossapalooza. Of course, we wanted it on the water and we, we thought, oh, this would be a good place, but you kind of needed to know someone who knew someone who was a member here and we didn't know anybody. And so Lyndon asked her mom and her mom was like, oh, my old neighbor, you know, the lake house, I think they know someone. And so they called someone who knew someone here in Chicago. And the next thing we knew, there was an email to Lyndon's mom or a text message and then Lyndon's texting with them and could we? And so they called the yacht club and the yacht club was like, yeah, that's a great idea. So here we are. So thanks Lyndon's mom and Lyndon. And my mom's still learning how to text message. So I'm really glad that your mom's able to pull it off. Uh, so you may have seen on the agenda that Congresswoman uh, Lisa McLean was supposed to be here. She was invited. Uh, it turns out that um, congressional representatives have to be on the Hill this week. We're disappointed that they didn't check with us first. And um, anyway, so she wasn't able to be here in person. And so her intention was to record some remarks. Uh, however, I think this time uh, didn't happen, but she sends her regards and her intentions. And, and uh, so I get to ad lib as to what she would say. <laughs> um, but how that happened with her potentially almost being here, either virtually or videoly or in person, uh, was that Gloss uh, did a bit of a Smart Great Lakes pitch a couple months ago to uh, congressional representatives in the region and her, her, some of her staffers were on that call and they learned about Smart Great Lakes Initiative, which is a larger um, program that Gloss is working on around the region about building a connected ecosystem. And she learned, she learned about this document somehow in there, which was the cost and approaches document, which we have printed copies of here. It's also online, which was, um, it was a, it's a report that Gloss put together as a result of studies uh, after working with Orange Force Marine, X Ocean, and Fugro to better, and, and, a, and a number of you, in fact, were involved in that as well, to better understand how much would it really cost to map the Great Lakes and could we pull it off in 8, 10, 15 years, and how would we do it? Her staff read that document and they contacted us after and said, you know, we want to get behind this. We really feel strongly about this. And, and Lisa McLean said, personally, it mattered to her and to her constituents because of the economic impact, it's fresh water. And I think she said, it just is common sense that we understand this foundational data set. So that's really what we're here about. And that's what she would say if she was here. So her office and, and another congressional office, Debbie Dingle's office is helping us draft legislation, which we're hoping is gonna work its way into the president's budget for FY23 to raise $200 million over the course of several years to do the actual mapping. And I might get my dream of buying a boat for Gloss, no, if we're lucky. But otherwise, I think it really it's going to involve a number of partners, which is why we're bringing technology people like you and government partners and other jurisdictions into the room to talk about this, to figure out if we did have $200 million, then how are the priorities? What are the areas we should focus on? Uh, what other groups should we involve in this effort? And then what technologies uh, should we employ and how do we ensure that the data is going to be accessible and equitable to everyone around the region. So to kick off this afternoon, uh, we've got Zdenka Willis, who's the president of the Marine Technology Society, and she's going to give just a few opening remarks. Um, and then we're going to move into our first panel. And before I did that, I did want to acknowledge, in addition to Lyndon's mom, who helped us get here with her texting and her neighbor's neighbor friend, uh, we couldn't be here without our sponsors. So a sincere thank you to all of our sponsors. And we're very, very fortunate to have a number of them. And some of them are related to bathymetry and some of them are related to uh, Seagull, a platform that we're developing. Um, so I did want to call them out. We've got some tables, not everyone has a table because maybe the Bellman uh, returned your FedEx box and said, thanks, you know, we don't want it. We're going to send it along somewhere else. So uh, unfortunately, R2 Sonic doesn't have a booth here, but Mike Brissett is here, so I welcome you to contact him. Uh, we've also got Spin Dance, uh, who's helping us build um, Seagull and Dig and RPS Group, all long partners of Gloss, uh, Bedrock Ocean Exploration. Thank you for being here and your sponsorship as well. R2 Sonic, I mentioned uh, Mike's been here. 
And um, his equipment was on Michael's construction, which was the red and black and silver vessel that many of you got a chance to ride on this morning. So that was fantastic. Thanks so much, guys, for being here and supporting Kongsberg. One of your Echo Sanders was on the RV Echo, which is a NOAA Glural vessel. So we're super appreciative, both of your participation and support in this event. And, um, and Bart from Army Corps of Engineers, who showed up unexpectedly, but much appreciated. So thank you for coming and bringing your vessel with your Rezon equipment. Um, Hans with Northwestern Michigan College, of course, uh, Stephanie Thunder Bay Marine Sanctuary, Mazarine Ventures, and uh, John Robinson is gonna welcome you later tonight. And uh, we're having a hosted reception by Mazarine Adventures, which we sincerely appreciate. And M2 Ocean and Med Ocean uh, are also here and have a booth and are doing phenomenal work, particularly with indigenous communities and crowdsource bathymetry and your amazing technology. So thank you for being here as well. Um, and where's Brian? Uh, with Sail Drone, uh, very much appreciate you being here. A big, big supporter of Lake Bed 2030. And now uh, you'll be back again in the fall, I believe, with a vehicle at the Lake Bed 2030 conference, which will be in Traverse City on September, September the 28th. And I think you're gonna have a vehicle there, Brian, if that's, we might have a vehicle there. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, I'm not gonna read all of Zdenka's bio because, oh my gosh, it's long. And are you an accomplished human being? I am so humbled to be standing beside you. Uh, so Zdenka is the president of the Marine Technology Society. I know you have a long history in ocean technology and policy. You have a very illustrious career. I didn't realize and actually until I read this that you were in the Navy and I think you had a rank as captain and then you've had many executive roles within the federal government, um, both on the civilian side and the, and the military defense side. So phenomenal background. Thank you Zdenka for being here today. You're going to give a few opening remarks. Um, why don't you just grab that microphone uh, and then we're gonna transition into our first panel on strategic approaches to uh, mapping the Great Lakes. Okay. So good afternoon. Normally I don't need a mic for those of you who know me. Um, it's great to be here and it's great to be back with my IUS colleagues. As we say, once an IUSian, always an IUSian. So it's great to be back. But um, I'm talking to you from the perspective of the Marine Technology Society. I'm not sure if you know who we are, but we've been around for since 1963. And it's a global organization, a professional society that brings together uh, government, academia, uh, industry to look at technology in support of humankind and you know, sustainability of the planet. Uh, we can, we're a convener. We get folks together through our sections and committees. So sections are geographically based. So Hans here in our Great Lakes. And then our committees are professionally based. We have student sections. We have marine camps, one of which is here in the Great Lakes. And we also have an early career ocean professionals. Um, we do also events. Uh, Oceans will be here for the first time in Great Lakes in 2025. And I'm really pleased that not only do we have individual members um, attending, we have our corporate um, members uh, of MTS. So that's a little bit about what MTS is. Um, now, switching to the topic today, I asked Hans, like, how much of the Great Lakes is actually mapped? And he said, if you look at all the sources, maybe we get to 15%. And so I always try to put that in context. And I know many of you who are in the bathymetric world, we always hear we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about the ocean bottom, but that doesn't really relate to like my mom. She just says, what does that mean, right? Or probably to the millennials in the room. So this is how I try to explain it. So. Everybody has the iPhone. It's the only way we know how to get around or your cell phone, your smartphone. So let's decide you want, you're in a new place and you need to go get that cup of coffee or that tea or that latte in the morning. And you don't really know where you are. And so you pull out the phone and imagine only 15% of the coffee shops are gonna show up and only 15% of the roads are gonna show up. That's a lot harder to get that cup of coffee than it would be if we actually knew, you know, 
what we see on our phones. And to me, that's the kind of comparison. And when we talk about how are we going to get this initiative funded and understood, I think we need to think in those kinds of terms. How do you relate it to the importance of understanding what's beneath what people can see on top the water with how it is important to navigation? You know, we're very familiar with NOAA and their charting responsibilities for safe navigation. But it's much more than that. You know, there's the um, biodiversity, there's the biological hotspots, there's the effect on climate, the effect on ecosystems, the effect on the economy of the Great Lakes, you know, the ability to drink water here in the Great Lakes. So I challenge, you know, because this community is part of the inside community, right? We're, how, but how do we relate? what is important, and I think the cost document that you referenced that can get folks behind you know, an initiative like this. The other thing I think is very important is, you know, as Tim said, this community has grown. This lake bed initiative has grown. And he's right, it's not owned by a particular individual, but it is important that there is an initiative that everybody feels welcome in and can participate in. Because one of the things that I witnessed when I was the director of IUSE, and I've talked about it a lot, is we tend to be a fractured community, okay? It's one technology versus another technology. Or in my case, I came out of the Navy and the word oceanography, I thought was all encompassing until I came into the IUS world and I used the word oceanography, unbeknownst to me, that was really code for physical oceanography. So the biologists were like, but you're not including me. And I'm like, okay, I didn't know I had to say physical and biological and chemical oceanography. And so internally we do that, but externally when we're speaking to funders, that message becomes very fractured. So what I really appreciate is that from the marine technology perspective and gloss to recognized terms with different in different communities are able to come together and support this initiative. So I think as you're thinking about this initiative is how do you create that partnership with multiple players but that everybody checks in and everybody is part of this because that's how you'll have influence and that's how the message will come across. And then, you know, finally, you know, as they say when the, in the um, seabed 2030, you know, every ping is important, but I say every ping has to count. And there are multiple technologies through which we can get the ping and or the picture? And how do we use those in a complementary fashion? And how do we use the um, professional acumen that the different groups bring to bring those disparate data sets together? Um, at lunch, we were just talking uh, at the table here in the back on, you know, what am I going to do with, how am I going to deal with all of the high resolution imagery because it's not just the bathymetry and, and what does USGS do? What does NOAA do? Where's that role for the commercial? Where does GLOSS come into the ability to bring that disparate data together? and make that available into information that somebody can use. And I touched on the various types of oceanographers, if you will, but the other type of, the other group that you need in the, in the uh, room at the same time, and you might not think about this, are the lawyers. You know, there's a lot of data issues and IP issues as we start to blend what historically has been data collected by federal agencies with data that's collected by the commercial uh, companies and how do we work through those discussions in a way that works for both the federal agencies 
and the corporate and be responsible to the citizens of, in our case here, the United States. You know, think about bringing the financers in. What are those creative ways in which you can finance and having the finance and the lawyers at the table at the beginning will allow this partnership, I think, to grow. So I'm going to stop there because there are a great panel Tim has put together that I'm very pleased to be part of with experts from the various um, perspectives. So as you hear these perspectives, think about the finally, you know, how do we bring that together? How do we challenge ourselves that we can be part of this greater good under the single initiative to really propel it forward? So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Fideka. All right, well, just before I call my uh, panelists up, <clears throat> a couple of changes to the program. The first one is, you may notice there's only four chairs. This one's mine that I get to lean against. Uh, David Miller from Fugro uh, has withdrawn due to COVID, unfortunately. So he's not able to be with us today, either in person or virtually, which is a shame. And, uh, and then the other uh, comment I just wanted to make, I know many of you come from companies where you have software as a service or platform as a service. Ken and I were talking earlier about robotics as a service. Uh, I'm Canadian and we've pretty much mastered the art of apology as a service. And uh, so I wanted to apologize to So Far Ocean for forgetting you earlier. Uh, and it's kind of weird because you're actually like my favorite OBS company. You know, you're doing like small, cool IoT devices rather than giant buoys. So I really love what you guys do. So I apologize for not calling you out as a sponsor. Tomorrow at the annual meeting, So Far Ocean will be doing a presentation as well. So. Sorry about that, and I uh, wanted to call you guys out. So, uh, Denis Haynes from H2I, come on up. Uh, Hans Van Sumeren from Northwestern Michigan College as well, and Meredith Westington from NOAA. All of you could come take a seat. I'm gonna sort of stay off to the side. We've got some questions to get going. This first session is on uh, this first section, and we're gonna try, you know, we do have a pretty packed afternoon, really kind of unlike this morning. Um, this morning was really intended to be more of a networking and relaxing, have some food, get to know each other, check out the booths and, and the vessels, of course, and have the opportunity to go on the water. Um, but this afternoon, we've got three sessions, three sections, I guess. The first one is on strategic priorities for mapping in the Great Lakes. The second one is on exploring, I didn't really mean it that way, but exploring underwater exploration technologies. But we've got four presentations uh, from companies, emerging technologies, who are going to uh, share with us some of their product uh, innovations and how that could help mapping in the Great Lakes. And then we're going to round out the afternoon with uh, data to insights and how we can make um, information and data more accessible and equitable as we have a range of sort of that data spectrum from acquisition to accessibility. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, what I'd like each of you to do, each of the three of you to do, because Zdenka has already done a phenomenal job of introducing herself, is just uh, maybe start Meredith with you, and then we'll go across to Denis. Just introduce yourselves for everyone, and um, and then I'll prepare the first question. I think the uh, AV group's got all of your mics sorted out. I did that on purpose. So is, oh, it is on. Okay, hi. Um, I'm Meredith Westington. I'm with NOAA's Office of Coast Survey in the Integrated Ocean and Coastal Mapping Program. Um, let's see, some of the things I work on are the um, US Bathy Gap Analysis. So I've been analyzing the publicly accessible data holdings um, at NCEI um, to find out how much of US waters is mapped. Um, and so that's, I've been reporting, I think Great Lakes is now 7% mapped, according to my analysis, that's the US side. Um, and then um, the other thing I'm doing is I'm leading a, a regional campaign in Alaska called Seascape Alaska. So it's a compliment to this lake bed 2030 thing. That's it. So hi, I'm Hans Van Sommer, I'm the director of the Great Lakes Water Studies Institute at Northwestern Michigan College. and. For those of you who may not know our college, um, we're in Northern Michigan. We're one of uh, 30 community colleges in Michigan, but what's unique about our program is that the state 
has authorized us to deliver bachelor's degrees. So we're one of the few colleges that gets to do that. And one of the emphasis areas is maritime technology because we host one of the US uh, uh, Merchant Marine Academies. And so with that endorsement, we were able to create a marine technology bachelor's degree, which really allowed us to focus on the use of technologies and the application of technologies towards mapping and surveying and doing things underwater. And um, I've worked with you know, all the, I think just about all the companies in here, everyone's been supportive of this development. And from the perspective of how we're gonna get this done, it was, I'll say, I wouldn't have been able to do anything without the collaboration of all the people that helped us make this happen. And it started for us by finding a shipwreck with a piece of equipment that really wasn't supposed to work in that deep water. And the company put it out, Kongsberg put it out worldwide and said, look what a community college could do with a piece of equipment and very little training with us not being there. And so that's when employers called, said, you're training hydrographers. I said, no, we found a shipwreck. What do you want? You know, and then that's how it all started. So these kind of conversations, I can go back 15 years and, and that's really where we started was a good conversation about what it took to get things done and what are the methods and techniques to do it. So it's exciting to be here. It's exciting to see everybody. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Um, by saying merci beaucoup, you can notice by my accent anyway that I'm a French Canadian. So it's a pleasure for me to be uh, with you this afternoon. I'm Denis Haines. I'm the president and CEO of H2I, which is my consulting company. Uh, so, but as a background, I'm the former Hydrographer General of Canada uh, and Director General of the Canadian Hydrographic Service. So that's my former life. I retired from that position four years ago. Um, I have many, so H2I is really the app that I'm using uh, this afternoon for, with you. So I'm not uh, going to um, provide comments or perspective or opinion from, for others, but uh, as a retiree, I have my consulting company, but uh, I have many pro bono or volunteer affiliation. So I'm uh, the uh, uh, US Canada Hydrographic Commission representative on the International Hydrographic Organization International Hydrographic Review, and I'm, the, I'm on the editorial board of this group. Um, I'm also an affiliate research scientist with the UNH, University of New Hampshire, in, um, here in the US. Uh, I don't pretend myself to be a, a senior uh, researcher, but uh, they provided me this title, and I'm very proud of that. Um, I'm also on the strategic advisory group of the CBED 2030, all that pro bono. I'm the vice president of CIDCO, uh, uh, of the board of director of CIDCO, which is a non-for-profit organization, similar to GLASS, but focus more on research and development uh, uh, for technology and also methodology. Uh, they are based in Quebec. And I'm the special senior advisor of the COMRAN, which stands for the Canadian Ocean Mapping Research and Education Network, which include many universities and technical college in Canada. So, and just to complete, I'm the hydro, an hydrospatial uh, advocate. So those of you in the room may have seen me virtually a lot because I'm this guy that spread the word hydrospatial because I believe that, you know, uh, as you said, uh, the blue side of the, our blue planet is really what is unknown. And it's unknown in my theory because we don't see it. What you don't see, you don't care as much as what you see. So the land side or the dry side of surveying is pretty better known than the, the wet side. So that's about me. All right, well, thank you very much. Well, just before I get into uh, the question, I, I wanna share with everyone how this is gonna work. So there is uh, two microphones in the room and anyone, uh, I, think, I think within reason, and really anyone can come up at any time and we'll just try to fold your question in. We also have something called slido.com. And for those of you who are on our Zoom call, I'm looking at you uh, at the GoPro. Um, you don't know that you're on the GoPro, but you look cool. And uh, we have a code, which is 587133, write that down, 587133. Um, anyway, if you go to slido.com, even on your phone, just a web browser, and um, <clears throat> you can enter that code and there's a, it's super simple, uh, questions or chat. So you could enter questions in there. We've got 
Shelby at the back is monitoring the chat, uh, as I will be a little bit on mine as well. And so you can upvote questions in case we're pressed for time. You can put your own question in uh, if you don't want to come up to the mic or, you know, or the timing doesn't allow it or whatever. So we're going to use slido.com all afternoon. And particularly for those of you who are on Zoom, we're using that because some of you can't use the chat function in Zoom, unfortunately. Uh, so that's why we're using slido.com. 587-133. Call now. All right, um, so let's get right into it. So a couple of you mentioned it already, which is great. It, you know, the Great Lakes have been mapped in varying degrees, whether it's 7% or 15% or 13, or who knows. You know, seabed 2030 faces the same challenge, like how much percent is it? And nobody, you know, I don't think we know concretely. And that doesn't matter. The concrete answer is they haven't been mapped completely. We can all agree on that. And uh, they certainly haven't been mapped in high resolution, which allows us to better understand and better model and, and better assess the impact that they have. So we could also we could also debate the value proposition of mapping in high resolution. That that comes up, but why should we map it? You know, like for Congresswoman Lisa McLean, it was um, because it makes sense to have this foundational data set. Uh, there are others who would challenge that there isn't a value proposition at all, or maybe it's more scientifically based. But let's put that aside. We'll put a pin in that. And let's just focus on if we had the means to do it, then how would we go about doing it? And so that's the first part of this little section is talk about priorities. So there's lots of different priorities. Canadian Hydrographic Service and Office of Coast Survey generally focused on navigable waterways, obviously safety of navigation, critically important. USGS, very concerned about benthic habitat modeling and mapping. So we've got lots of different agencies, lots of different groups with different interests and priorities. So given that, how do we mesh all that together into a common goal? Any one of you can start. I think there is no magic bullet, magic solution. Uh, I think what you've started to do is a good start. We have to go broader than bathymetry, broader than hydrography. It is what I'm calling hydrospatial. So it's all about the blue, our blue planet. And in the case of the Great Lakes, it's the Great Lakes. So it's uh, uh, fresh water and involve the communities. The, the, I think we have to make that as broad as possible to um, uh, resonate with stakeholders. It's a challenge because you cannot please all. It's gonna be the challenge to identify which come first if funding is not fully there. Yeah, I'll pick up on that in that I think your your point on communities is really important. You know, you've got to be able to relate to communities, whether it is, you know, the the local community or the business community, however you define that community. And that, you know, that can help you understand where you might be, where you've got the most traction and your prioritization. I mean, NOAA's going to always have that navigational prioritization. It's what the charter and the mandate is, right? Um, but NOAA also has a very wide mission in, in some of those other areas. But I think the fact if you can articulate what your end goal is and you can relate your message and tailor your message to each to those various communities, you're not sure where you're gonna strike gold first, but you at least have that end goal mapped out. So folks like to understand, you know, how much am I gonna spend and when am I gonna be done, right? That's a typical, typical um, budget person in the government. How much is this gonna cost me? But more importantly, when am I gonna be done? So. I might be able to weigh in. Um, so in the uh, IOCM, Integrated Ocean and Coastal Mapping Program, we did a spatial priority study for the Great Lakes. And um, I did not run it personally, uh, but uh, you can find the recording on our website. You can find the results on our website. Um, but what the, what's happened, what I noticed was that um, the coastal areas are the highest priority. Um, and what I thought was really strange was that the deep water areas, there were actually a number of people that said that they didn't think it needed to be mapped at all. They didn't have, it wasn't a priority for them, um, which in other parts of the US, usually when somebody says that it's not a priority, it's because it has already been identified as mapped. 
Um, and the Great Lakes, we've already decided, is not mapped. So it's very strange to find that the whole middle of the lakes, um, no, nobody thought it was a priority. So I dug into that a little bit um, before coming here. And I think if you go in and look at the Great Lakes um, priorities results, it looks like it doesn't include the Office of Coast Survey. So we often talk about safe navigation and charting as our mission. And in other parts of the US, we'll say, you know, primarily the ports, you know, where the, where the vessels travel, that's kind of our priority area. Well, we actually have priorities that are in that zone that nobody else called out as a priority <laughs> along the coast. Um, so I, that's just a long way of saying that I think that there's a lot of interest across the lake for numerous reasons. Um, and I think that um, the priorities if the goal is to map 100%, then the priorities play into who's got money, where might you start the work, but presumably you will eventually cover it all, right? That's the game. That's the game. Okay. Working on it collaboratively and building community. Yeah. Hans, have you got a perspective? Yeah, no, and I, I was gonna add, sometimes it's the tiniest component that rises to the top in terms of prioritization because it was completely unknown. And often that can be the poster thing that elevates the entire mapping community. So um, I think there's a lot of those out there and, and those will pull at various communities to really say this matters. And I can see multiple perspectives on that. So I want to add something about the distinction between mapping and surveying, because as hydrographer general of Canada myself, I was often told, but what's the issue with the Canadian Arctic? It's map, it, 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 but the map is not good enough. And there's, so you can, and everything is mapped to the best information available. So, but it's not properly surveyed. The data is not sufficiently uh, dense to cover what you want to cover. Accuracy is important. Scale is important. So when you show the JEBCO, the general uh, bathymetric chart of the world, people will say, yeah, no better the face of the moon, but you have a map here. So again, that's the challenge we have with mapping. Often maps exist, they are there, but they're the best representation with the information available. We have to say that they are not as good as they need to be nowadays and not surveyed properly. So that's why the deep water is often not as good as well surveyed because it's not as important for hydrographic offices. Well, you raise a really good point about density. And I think that uh, has a corollary with priorities because when I first met Peter Esselman and he was talking about for the USGS and looking at benthic habitat mapping and he was using like ultra high resolution, you know, video camera acquisition of um, features on the lake floor to better understand, right, that biology. And, but, and, and very much suited so for those applications, but then there's other applications, maybe safety of navigation, for instance, where it's 1% of water depth or whatever the hydrographic standard is. So how do we, how do we square up, you know, that puzzle where we've got uh, maybe density difference goals or targets based on the priority or the application of um, what they want to use within the tree for. So I'll make a comment not on on how, how to square that up, but the comment that I want to make is that we have to realize that we can be too scientific and when we're talking. You know, if you if the community can come together and say, you know, we need to have this surveyed or mapped and don't confuse, don't, don't give them too many terms to confuse them with. Um, and this is this is the density, the accuracy that we that we want. And you go basically if you need to for the strictest accuracy, because that's really where you want to get to. This is our end goal. And then what are the steps people can take to be able to contribute to make every ping count or every image count and and keep boil that down to as simple as you can with as singular a you know a number that you can because this is all this is aspirational so go for that aspirational 
don't say, well, you know, this, this group needs it at one resolution, this group needs it at another. So, so go for the aspirational. And then if it's consistent and persistent messaging, that, that's, you know, as, as you said, there is no silver bullet, there's no silver, silver you know, uh, meeting, bullet meeting, but persistence, 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 and the same message with everybody repeating it, all of your constituents, whether they be the national governments, national agencies, federal agencies, US, national agencies in Canada, uh, academia and industry, they know what those requirements are and they can then contribute. So you make it easy to contribute. So I guess I, from my perspective, I, I wouldn't worry about spending a lot of time trying to determine you know, whose priority or which priority um, and which accuracy we need to go for. Take the most aspirational and put that out there that this is what we're going for. And if you don't quite reach it, it's better than you know, not getting to what you need. So that's how I'd, I'd view that. There might be a component with that of, of how crowdsource bathymetry builds into identifying areas that require that, that real high precision. And so utilizing everything that we can, but, but helping it guide where we want to go to next. And so I could see that as being a very valuable contribution towards creating higher prioritization areas with base knowledge. Yeah, Denny? I think in terms of the communities, and you brought that back uh, from what I said at the beginning, it, it, you know, it's the basic principle of what's in it for me. What does it give me more to have all that? And uh, I want to acknowledge the document, the cost and approaches is really good from that perspective because it goes to the facts, the direct facts that were not all uh, integrated in a document. So it's a very good starting point. So just marketing it, making sure that people know about it. Uh, when you'll bring people around the table, we can dream and yes, we should have the best possible solution, but we also have, I think, to acknowledge that it might not be all the same everywhere. You may need more accuracy, more data in some areas, and you can live with maybe less for a while in other areas. Uh, it's gonna be difficult to prioritize, but if you start with the coastal areas, that's where most of the human activities take place. You have to go further offshore by thinking also of the benthic habitat, as you mentioned, and the species and all that we rely on, um, but it's a mix of everything. That's what makes it more challenging because who comes first? You know, the golden rule is the one that will want to make money first, will decide where it goes. Uh, and that's gonna be part of it. But at the same time, there might be very legitimate values in terms of uh, knowing something offshore that we don't think is as important. But I think it's, uh, Priorities is a kind of iteration mode. So you have to put something out there, what you think is the best. So best accuracy, best coverage everywhere is the silk kind of blanket. I would suggest that we need a quilt instead, which will not be as nice, not as comfy, but will do the job because you will have nice pieces in some areas and you will have more patchy area where it may be sufficient. It's gonna be a blanket and you will have something, but it's not gonna be as nice everywhere. To um, be realistic. Yeah, I was just gonna add that um, we've been having these same discussions within our like Alaska, Seascape Alaska and the, um, you know, if, if folks want one meter resolution or, or higher um, up along the coast in particular for um, habitat mapping, um, you know, then people say, well, is that what you want everywhere? 200 meters offshore, 500 meters, 1,000 meters. And the cost associated with trying to, even if you could collect that data, which I think there's some technical issues there, um, but just the cost of trying to collect that data becomes exponentially higher. Um, and so, and then the question is, did anybody really want it at that resolution that far offshore? And so it's a, it's a mixed bag. Um, and I think what we've established, though, is that um, a framework, something is better than nothing. So, you know, develop the framework. And then what, will, what we're expecting will happen is there will be more questions that will be asked 
about that data and it will there will be more so maybe you'll get that one meter resolution eventually for that data that nobody seems to care about right now um but i, I think to denny's point it's kind of a mixed bag a quilt right a quilt. it's iterative and if you have something that is not good enough at least if someone asks for more you know it's becoming a priority because you didn't have that good enough but it, we have to agree that priorities or plans are important but they're there to be changed and adapted all the time well i think that the message that we're hearing is probably that it, it will be a patchwork of efforts and it, it although may be aspirational to one percent of water depth or one meter resolution or whatever it may be but it will result in a patchwork of efforts and it could be a uh, parallel there could be uh, one priority or a high priority by one agency and a high priority or another agency that don't necessarily supersede each other because they're happening at the same time. And that I think actually is part of the, the secret in the success of a program like this or an initiative like this is having lots of people working on their priorities at the same time so we can build that blank up <clears throat> as we go. So I think we, we kind of answered the second question. And before I move on to the next section, I did want to open it up. I was Try not to be rude looking at my phone here, but I was actually looking at slido.com to see if there was any questions that had come in. So does anyone, while we're talking about priorities for mapping in the Great Lakes, did anyone from the audience, either on Zoom or here in the room, want to ask a question? Uh, the next section we're going to move on to is funding. Everybody likes to talk about money. Okay. <clears throat> so we're actually running five minutes ahead of schedule so we've got loads of time to talk about the funding um so we you know there's i, I mentioned earlier in this cost and approaches document that we work with three separate companies and we intentionally chose those companies for uh some very specific purposes x ocean is primarily uh uh um, uncrewed surface vessel remotely operated or uh, semi-autonomous vehicle and very green technology, relatively low cost, sort of on a per day basis. Fugro, of course, very traditional hydrographic surveying, employs a range of technologies. And Orange Forest Marine, based out of Port Stanley, Ontario, uh, you know, no offense there, more of a boutique survey company, right? Using vessel of opportunity and sort of putting together what you can, what you have for the projects that you had. And it was very interesting to get the results back from all three companies and their analysis of each of them were very detailed albeit different from each other. Um, and uh, ultimately the question posed to those companies was, A, can it be done? Uh, and B, how would it be done? What technologies would you recommend? And then C, how long would it take? And all of them came back and said, yes, of course it could be done. And yes, we could use a range of technologies or we could only use one technology or whatever. And then all of them came back and the price point was somewhere between 135 to $190 million. So that's just cost of acquisition. That's not me buying boats, right? That's using vessels of opportunity and survey companies and government sources and whatever to get the job done. And it probably doesn't even include, include post-processing of the data, which we all know can take sometimes at least as long as the survey itself. Um, however, looking at a target number of roughly $200 million, the question to the panel here is, should that responsibility fall among the national government? whether it be Canada or the United States. To ask for that money? To no, that I mean, money? is the responsibility of mapping the entire region in high definition, high density, the responsibility of the government and therefore the funding of it? <laughs> I'm not looking at you, Meredith. <laughs> 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 Ideally, of course, it's easier to deal with the federal entity to agree that it's important and it's going to be funded centrally. However, you know, the, the ideal is really what, what is happening. Uh, federal governments, I'm not speaking on behalf of Canada, neither CHS here, um, have many priorities and they cannot deal with what they already have. So unless it is brought forward politically uh, with all the tools that you have with all the benefits it it will take some time to get that approved uh, and you know reality being what it is in terms of uh, governments 
it's there is a change of government from time to time and one government can agree the next one can disagree so sustainability usually has in the past been stronger with governments but recent uh, experiences demonstrate it's not always the case it can change quite drastically from direction from one government to another so we have to have something more sustainable and that's why Ideally, I would say yes, it would be better, but from what I know, I saw the last federal budget in Canada about a month ago, uh, three weeks ago, uh, good news about oceans and about uh, continuing the ocean protection plan, but the budget is a budget, it doesn't go into the detail, and we don't know yet what it means for the Great Lakes as an example. We know that there were many other areas, like Canadian Arctic as an example, where sovereignty is an issue might likely be more important, but I don't know, I'm just expressing a perspective here, uh, than the Great Lakes, because the Great Lakes is more contained, it's more somewhat known. Um, so I think that would be ideal, but I'm not sure it's possible. I think diversity of funding would probably make it more possible on the short term to start. I'll just add, having those numbers out there now creates a competitive look from the business community where you know i've got something i can do it for less than that and so i like that that might engage challenges from people to step in and say i've got a new idea i've got a new platform i've got a new way of doing this and then maybe from a state perspective or a province perspective or a national uh, government perspective people might buy into that technology as a test case and then get a piece of it done that way so the number is is now a challenge because it's out there and anyone who's in the business is going to say i can do it for in three notes if i go back to name that tune days so yeah yeah hans i think you bring up a, a really good point in that yeah the numbers out there so the challenge is there um i think that the responsibility for the um you know federal agencies is, you know, we'll look at NOAA. I mean, the main responsibility is safety, you know, and so that doesn't encompass all of the uses of the information. So I think that the agent, the national governments on both sides, you know, Canada and US, they have a responsibility to provide funding at a level that um, enables that safety mission first and foremost. I think that, and, and the, but the reality is there will not be enough funding from the federal government's you know, respective um, to make this happen. That's just the reality. And so I think the public private partnership uh, and where that economic um, perspective comes in where the states see an economic um, benefit to this and uh, where a business sees an economic opportunity as Hans was talking about um, and then yeah the funding right now the a, a greater majority of the funding is in that philanthropic community and whether it be an organization or an individual, uh, there is a recognition um, that uh, through ESG efforts, companies that you might not think about traditionally in this sort of space needs to be able to go back to their stakeholders and say, we are doing something in this area. Um, how, uh, you know, how you go about approaching those kinds of non-traditional funding. You know, do you, you know, do you go to a, uh, you know, a uh, fashion company, you know, uh, H&M, somebody like that, who's, you know, the fashion business isn't really known for their environmental um, record. Okay, it's a very consumable type of business. So do you create a challenge, you know, own a lake, map a lake. You know, um, prizes and competitions we've seen have been, um, have been, uh, you know, a, a, a good way to do that. But, you know, try to get a sponsorship, sponsor half a lake. You know, I think you're going to have to be very creative because it won't 
I think, I think we can unequivocally say, I'm not speaking for the US government either, and we won't put our, our government colleagues on the, on the, uh, the uh, hook here, but I, I can pretty much tell you that from what I've seen of the budgets, it's not something that the US government will be able to take on completely, but they have a responsibility in engaging the congressional, at least for the US, engaging the congressional to put pressure in a way that also doesn't, you know, pressure is good and bad from a congressional, congressional perspective in the U US if you're in an agency. But, you know, so be, be mindful of that, but that's, that's where that pressure will need to come. Uh, Meredith, did you want to comment as Meredith? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I guess I'm, I guess I'm hearing several things, but um, so the 200 million, um, like who, so there's a number of ways I guess you could try to get that money. Um, and philanthropy seems like a viable, good, good plan. Um, I think we talked earlier about priorities within the Great Lakes. And I think we already recognize that for like hydrographic survey priorities, as much as we, we think we should be able to map all of the US EEZ. Um, the reality is that um, there's only so much money and there's there's so much more US EEZ. Um, and so, you know, the 200 million is, it, you, you want 200 million for the Great Lakes to camp, as a campaign to, to map the Great Lakes. Um, and so you need to get that. <laughs> um, but what I was gonna say was that um, in terms of- And I of, need it now. You need it now. You do need it now because that's the other. Because I've been tracking this progress, right? And like, and it's we're not progressing very fast, especially in this region relative to all the other parts of the U.S. Um, so, uh, anyways, the um, the thing I was going to say though was that you could. Um, there's a couple of things. Is that you know the Office of Coast Survey. Um, we're very much you know when we talk about surveying. Um, making sure that you are mapping surveying to specific standards um, means that whatever money you do take in has impact. Um, you don't want to waste that money. Um, and so making sure that you're bringing those folks into the fold, whether, you know, we end up being the leaders. I don't know if that's necessarily we have to be the leader, but we, we would definitely need to be involved for sure. Um, and then, uh, you know, some, some avenues that you might consider is that we still have out that um, annual Brennan matching fund. So we're gonna announce that um, for the third year this summer. Um, it's underutilized, um, but basically the idea is that if you have um, non-federal entities with funds um, that want to come to the table um, with the Office of Coast Survey, um, that we might match that um, in some way and have a partnership and it's matched through the um, contracts. So you, you transfer the money over to the Office of Coast Survey and then it's run through the contracting process, which means that you get all of the contracting stuff that happens with it, um, including all of the, um, the quali you have qualified people conducting the surveys and then the data goes all the way in through the pipeline to NCEI um, and then onto the charts because we still care about charts. Um, but yeah. I was to ask, add something related to matching funds because that's a formula that exists in government sometime for infrastructure where the province, uh, the federal in Canada, so meaning the states and the federal in the US could uh, give a third, a third. And if you have a private uh, partner could bring the third as well. Uh, so uh, it is more realistic because often it, really means that it's valuable because every party is want to invest. Uh, so that's more likely a, a model that could, could work. Um, and especially when it comes to the very low level communities, very small communities that want something to, for just approaches or small uh, ports or uh, uh, where you, you can involve uh, indigenous communities, you can involve other groups, uh, often for what they need, what's in it for me, they would get, it's not big, it would not cover a lot, but it would be, you know, a, a drop in the bucket. And uh, it starts like that. 
uh, and matching funds for a bigger area is probably more viable. Although I think it has to be done in with different options. So yes, you, you should continue to go after the 200 million, but with fragmentation or with uh, options or with different um, model and the uh, matching is, is one that showed benefits in the past for technology development as well. So it could work with that. If I might add, I really want to pick up on Meredith's point. You know, I, I said a comment, every ping needs to count. And so if you're going to spend the money and as you're putting this framework together, and we know that it's going to be a framework and a quilt and a patchwork, is how do you make that count? You know, how do you collect the data in which it's going to be impactful? So I really, you know, um, echo Meredith what you said and, you know, and, and having the, the right partnership at the table and, and having, you know, Oxford Coast survey and, and at the table. And then as you were talking about, you know, how do you put that framework together of all these different little uh, different campaigns? Because, you know, there's no single solution. So you have organizations like Gloss. You have the Marine Technology Society that can work together to help put those, you know, various campaigns together, as well as, you know, in Gloss, the data management expertise that you can also bring to the table because you're looking at disparate types of data. So, you know, uh, it's a, you know, federal, non-federal program that's attached to Offset the Coast Survey because you know, NOAA is the lead federal agency, but it includes USGS, it includes Army Corps, includes all of these federal agencies and GLOSS being that regional element, you know, that's where you can get that synergy because as much as it would be great, it would be easier if somebody put the $200 million there and, we, and it all gets collected, but it's not gonna be there. So I think it really is valuable, you know, to have these communities or, already in existence that already have those structures. So similar, Meredith, as you were talking about, yeah, contracting is never easy, right? So you've got these various mechanisms and, and, and continuing to bring those entities that already exist to bear, I think is important. And the, um, the entity that already exists, the uh, GLOSS is capable of pooling funds over multiple years. That I think is the key piece of this puzzle. Um, well, it sounds like what you're saying is that GLOSS could serve like the glue that would sit in the middle of all this and then we'd have to change our name to glues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, well, we're gonna talk about coordination and um, sort of aggregation in a little bit. I want to touch a little bit more on the funding piece. Before we go on, is there any questions from the audience? Uh, where's, let's see, Shelby, yeah. There is one on Slido. Um, the question relates, and you guys sort of started to touch on it in that last discussion, is how can academia, government, and industry work better together to engage with Capitol Hill on this need for mapping the Great Lakes? So you guys kind of touched on it, but I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add with that focus on, Capitol Hill or Parliament. Yeah, I wanted to say something related to that because academia can play a role by providing expertise and uh, the government more the standards part of it to make sure that it respects standards. So sometimes this is uh, not cash, but this is value that are brought to the table. And this is something that can count in the matching as well. Um, Remember when I was uh, uh, director general of CHS, there was a, a big LIDAR project, um, not big, a, a, a LIDAR project in the Great Lakes. And uh, it was clearly not driven by the priority we had. So what we provided is technical expertise to make sure that the contract was well dressed to meet standards and data was validated. So there was a cost, the cost of one employee that went through that, but it was not a direct cost in terms of funding for the program we had to do. So I don't know, I think uh, organizations are more open to that than direct funding, uh, but, but I cannot speak for academia, but academia also have quite a lot of uh, asset in terms of knowledge and as access to students that could contribute true learning for direct contribution at the end of the day. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add on to that, Denny. That's great. The, the, the value of training a properly uh, 
available workforce is something that's not going to be going away. And we may touch on this a little later too, but that component along with the development of new technologies and the integration of business and then the government component bringing it together, that perfect Venn diagram where we all operate in the center, um, that's how these public-private partnerships really, I think, evolve and, and develop to be very powerful. Uh, but that workforce component absolutely is a, is a, a highly valued government perspective in terms of STEM training and new career workforce training opportunities for, for people coming into the, into the, the jobs world. So since the question said on Capitol Hill, I'll, I'll take it that it, it's referring from a U.S. perspective because I won't be able to talk on Parliament. I think that what I went back, when I started with the consistent and singular message that this is the initiative and that here is the job opportunity, here is how academia um, is participating in this. Here's how the federal agencies, in our case in the US, are participating. You can use folks like the Marine Technology Society who has the ability to get messages up to the Hill. BLOST has a, a, a way to get messages up at the at Hill. But the real key is if the Hill hears the same message from their constituents that you are in the community and this is important. It is important to my company because I have jobs that I can um, you know, uh, attribute to this and it, and it helps my bottom line. And from the academia perspective that it's likely to increase the grants. And if they hear the same message from all of those communities that's where you have the influence. Because, and you know, I, I go back to a story at the National Ocean Service when I was uh, director of IUS, and there's a number of offices who have something to do with the oceans, coasts, and Great Lakes. And we come to it from different perspectives. And we have IUS, we had our, our estuary um, association, we had the uh, coastal states organization, we had Sea Grant, and they would go up to the hill. And by the end of the day, and, and everybody's up there, we used to do March Madness, when, in, which was you know, going up to the hill and selling your various programs. And by the end of the day, you know, it would be like, it, it just became a blur because everybody came in in different ways. So the assistant administrator for the National Ocean Service got us all together with our external um, associations and we wrote what we called a coastal wrapper. So that there was a overall message at that coastal and Great Lakes at the wrapper level. And then when IUS came in or um, the estuary or the sanctuaries or the coastal services, at least there was that main message. And that actually helped elevate the National Ocean Service, not only inside of NOAA, we won't talk internal politics, but on the Hill that it could be understood. So again, it's that campaign on the Hill. And you know, if you're a representative, you're looking at, am I gonna bring you know, jobs back to my, my community? Am I gonna bring money back to my academic community? Am I going to provide a service to my community? That's what the, the elected representatives and then the senators from the whole state, that's what they're focused on. So your initiative where everyone can get behind that and show their piece of it is your best opportunity for a campaign on the Hill. A really good message uh, and takeaway. And I think when I said my opening remarks were Lake Bed 2030 was owned by no one, but you know, welcome to everyone kind of thing. Uh, your comments reinforce that certainly. So we've talked a lot about uh, perhaps the necessity for government to be involved at the very least, right? Uh, to help ensure standards, use a map once used many times, you know, ensuring the benefit of that um, data gets counted. Uh, we've also talked about some ways to better approach 
potentially Parliament and certainly uh, the Hill, uh, to put some money in, maybe not all of it, or maybe all of it, but are there other ways, and you talked about a little bit, Zdenka, about maybe philanthropic approaches. I'm wondering about crowdfunding. Do we look at micro donations, um, uh, citizens getting involved? Are there other, other levers that we could pull among the community? Uh, I think John stepped out, but actually you talked about as well about companies uh, through their ESG uh, efforts want to leave a mark. Talk to another gentleman who manages uh, ultra high net worth individuals, and these are people who want to like leave their mark on the planet, you know, they're investing or they're uh, putting money into um, green projects or projects that could uh, impact or better understand climate change or, or uh, reverse it. So are there other levers we could pull among a broader community to help raise some of this money, whether it was coordinated or supported by the federal governments as well? You know, Lyndon, I'll bring up our conversation earlier, your previous role as with regional land conservancy and, and the idea that those groups engage philanthropic donors in tens of millions of dollars to save land. And why wouldn't there potentially be a, a, a blue uh, group that could do the same thing? Um, and I think that's, uh, and, and perhaps from the sanctuary in Thunder Bay, I know the, the, when you create something that seems to be protected, are you limiting its, its availability and some of the early sanctuary comments from the people? And I think that's, that's a messaging uh, issue that can be solved, or at least can be, but to, to engage someone, and as you said earlier, Zdenka, was, you know, this is your piece of the Great Lakes. I donated $10 million to pay for Brian to come map it with sail drum, because I really liked what he had, and we wanted to test it out that's great. Now we're 10% done or 5% done or whatever it is. So there's not a simple answer to it, but I would say that it's not something you can really do ad hoc, right? So you think about, you know, when you, when you get together and we think about, okay, we've got data. So we've got our data working groups. Okay. You almost have to think about, I need to have a working group that is focused on this and then you're going to, need to look at other disciplines you know i'm not an expert on how to go and engage high net worth individuals and or philanthropic but there are people who do that so that's what i was talking about you know expanding our audience past our own you know scientific and and whether it's the lawyers from the data which i think is very important but also the financers so the only thing I might offer is, okay, if, you know, you have this goal out there, there's going to have to be multiple types of funding. Bring, spend some, you know, resources to bring some expertise in so that you're able to do a targeted campaign. Um, I think is, you know, what, a way to look at it, because I'm not an expert, and I know that, right? We, we, and, but in your community here, go out and see if you can't find some of those experts who will be willing to sit on a, willing to come in, pro bono, if they are, to help you, are, you know, put that plan together so that when you do go talk to whomever, you know how to talk because it's not a one and done is my understanding you know it's a relationship and a trust that you have to build um, to be able to get to that philanthropic or to that company's you know um, uh, ESG perspectives and I don't know if you have experience in that arena but don't have that yeah. much experience on that, but I, I just want to follow up on the, I think what needs to happen is the common denominator for all. And all those potential sources of funding or contributors would only be welcome, but I think it needs to be crafted in a strategy, not, mm -hmm. you know, you can start with one geographic area where, you know, there would be more interest in terms of either philanthropy or uh, private companies. Uh, private companies in the field are often 
showing um, a way to change, the, you know, the culture. What Fugro has been doing by providing crowdsourced data from their ships in transit is a very good model to demonstrate their commitment, I think, uh, to the global good because they would sail anyway between one project to another. So this data may not be as good because it's not all controlled, it's not all corrected, but it's data that in some cases would not have been uh, gathered. So companies may have ideas like that that would bring value, uh, but all those elements would just build, I think, the case further and stronger to go to the decision maker at the federal level to say, look, we have about that percentage of the 200 million that is coming from, from the stakeholders. So it demonstrates that there is a value. There's always a risk because by doing so, <laughs> they can just tell you, try harder and get it all funded by, ex by external. That might happen, but um, I don't think we are in that world anymore. Uh, and if there is real value, you, you will have that kind of uh, funding. But I'm not an expert in terms of gathering this uh, type of uh, information, but I think it's a model to, amongst many, that should be uh, developed and a strategy put in place probably by geographic area footprint in order to, uh, to demonstrate the feasibility and extend if possible. Well, okay, we've got, we've got a question and I'll just sort of summarize then what you were saying. It sounds like ad hoc, a truly ad hoc approach may not be effective and having something more coordinated uh, or, or a group, a stakeholder group putting out a series of best practices or common, um, common foundational goals and alignments would be would be helpful. Uh, Mike, why don't you go first? Yeah. Got a question from the audience? Yeah, question from the audience. Just a, a quick one. As you, one of the topics you touched on is philanthropic funding, uh, maybe high net worth individuals or people with influence. If you go in that route, you know, you're kind of, you know, do we do this on a geographic route? How do we find these people? How do we reach these people? And as I look around this building, on the waterfront <laughs> that has a membership of people who are a very concerned with the great mm -hmm. lakes b some of them are high net worth and some of them they might not be high net worth but they are still very concerned with mm -hmm. uh, mapping of the oceans or sorry mapping of the lakes um how many yacht squadrons are there how many marinas are there around the great lakes where you can reach every one of these individuals be they high influence high net worth or just concerned citizens who want to see things go on this is a great place to start to reach these individuals yeah, I would agree. And I would maybe even call it crowdfunding, you know, and it really goes from micro donations all the way up to larger donations as well. You think that has a place here? Everything has a place here. I mean, it, you, it is just the nature of what, what, what we're trying to do, you know, whether it's, you know, mapping here at the Great Lakes or in the greater ocean observing. So absolutely, I think that's great. I mean, you know, but but what is that right way to engage? So, you know, who, you know, you got here because of a, you know, a friend of a mother of, you know, that securitist route, but now you have an individual here. So you go back to the individual and say, okay, we, it was great, we had this meeting here, but now we have this Great Lakes initiative. And we'd really like to be able to, you know, expound and, and talk to the members. How does one do that? And then, well, if we do it here, how can we go all the way around the lakes to the various yacht clubs? And you, you start with one and, and you continue to, to move that forward. I think that's a great idea. Uh, I echo that. It sounds like I would need a, go, a boat to go between all the yacht clubs. <laughs> Uh, Shelby, I'll, I'll ask question. Kelly on that one. There's a, a question from the Zoom. Yeah, the Zoom from room. this. Yeah, from Slido. Um, so the comment was that government foresight can be short, and public-private partnerships can result in complex IP issues. How do we manage this binational effort to ensure that the data is openly shared? Excellent question. Who wants to tackle that first? To make it simple, you just have to play that, make that as the rules. You contribute, you share. 
it's a rule number one. Rule number uh, one. Rule number one. So you establish uh, the you know rule of engagement, and you want to engage, you have to share. If you don't want, so of course it, there's it's always a question of negotiation and uh, compromises. Uh, but it should be rule number one: accessible data, reusable data, interoperable data, findable data. And that's where I think uh, more uh, neutral organizations, such as uh, uh, non-for-profit or academia, and or government too, are playing uh, could play that role of coordinating uh, rather than and having private cont contributing at the level they want. That's the model uh, I would suggest. So as a one of the discussions um, that I'm involved in and in, in some consulting that I do is really on that understanding the, the data and the licensing associated with federal agencies using commercial data. And there's actually a tabletop exercise that we conducted uh, in October and you can go to usgo.gov website and under under what we do under the national plan, you'll find something called the commercial task team. So while I agree that that the top the entire um, the the reports there, but also the the recording. Um, so while I agree that the rules of engagement, uh, you know, on being able to share, there is a commercial uh, discussion that needs to be had. And it comes down to how you articulate the licensing. And that really is the conversation and the negotiation that needs to be done up front. And uh, so I think it, it, it really, the private companies that were involved, a lot of them came from the imagery side because it's a bit more mature than the companies coming from the in situ, if you will, side of the, of the um, discussion. And it, when we heard from you know, Planet and Maxar and, and, and those companies, th there's a very willingness to share um, and a need to have those conversations on what that licensing is about and you know what tier of license that the federal agencies are going to um, purchase so again that that goes back to having and they all have lawyers who are part of the company that are involved in this so it's, it's really a negotiation that has to happen there is an important element also related to that in terms of when we're talking about data it's a resolution or the accuracy. So mm -hmm. sometimes some companies do not want to share their data for commercial confidentiality or departments for security mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. But a lower resolution, a subset of the data may well do as good for instead of having nothing. So in the negotiation, that's where also the resolution can be discussed. And in some areas, it would be nice to see a kind of a platform where you see maybe areas where it doesn't look like I have data, but we know in a different color that data exists, but is not made available unless there would be national emergencies or so, so that type of thing. So at least you know that it's, avail it's possibly available, maybe at a cost, but at least you would have this data available. And often it's in the offshore or due to you know uh, the value of the minerals or oil and gas and things like that where you can get uh, data that is more protected but often it's either not negotiated or approached or sometimes there's no opening for that but most of the time i think there would be openings for lower resolution data well it sounds like that as we gain move to the next phase really of lake bed 2030 which is building awareness and, and getting stakeholders uh, engaged that it would be really wise to put put out a, a list of rules or best practices or statements up front so everyone is aware to answer the question that was posed. Um, in the, uh, we've got probably 
time for one more question. If there is any more from the Zoom room or uh, from the audience. Um, <clears throat> the last section that we were gonna spend some time on, but we're running a bit short, but we actually, the last section was, was about approaches uh, to how we would do this. So we've, we've touched on that throughout this conversation, which has been really good. Um, and I wanted to uh, maybe just, because we've got just a few minutes left, for each person to give their perspective on what do you think the next step, the next like tangible next step that I would say this informal collective group that forms Lakebed 2030 uh, should take? Why don't you start, Meredith? Um, I think you should start pooling money <laughs> at Gloss and then put in for the Brennan Matching Fund so that in FY24, you can execute. That sounds like a great strategy. <laughs> You know, I, I would say that, um, you know, fully understanding what we have and then the ways we can all contribute uh, would be building that out. And, and so we're all doing some sort of mapping or many people are getting the word out that your contributions do matter. And, and I know that's happening, but make that a priority so that we can get as much done without having to spend additional dollars with, with information that's already out there. I would say uh, establish a plan for marketing what you already have, which is pretty good, to be better known by stakeholders and potentially identifying, and the example of the Yacht Club here is a good example, key uh, target key individuals that would have influence to at least educate, inform uh, of what we're trying to achieve and what's the value of that. So many people probably don't know yet, especially the one that are not as involved at the, as this community. So, uh, and philanthropy is, is, is one more specific. If there is someone somewhere that knows someone that has a lot of money that would like to invest, would be nice to know. Um, however, you know, philanthropy being what it is, sometimes, Philanthropy money will not mix with other philanthropy money, so you have to manage that as well. But I would say a marketing and strategic plan with deadlines to, to get some results. Um, government being one path, uh, federal, provincial, or state uh, being the second path, and also going down to the community and identify the, the um, how you call that, uh, low-hanging fruits to demonstrate that it's workable, doable, with a variable geometry of funding and uh, of stakeholder involvement. Uh, so you have very good material right now. You have good content. So how to make that known and palatable for uh, investors mm -hmm. and, and people that will see the value. And with the people that are in this room, clearly there is a commitment, there is an understanding, but how can we uh, echo what's gonna be also done? Because it's not a one organization job, but if GLASS is the kind of lead uh, to make sure that if something is happening somewhere else, it's connected. It's informed. So that's always the issue. You know, data sets, there are many data sets that exist that nobody knows about. And it's often coming from academia because they were protected but to be uh, for scientific papers and things like that. And they were not correlated properly. Or, and, but there are many data sets that are unavailable or not made available because people don't know they could contribute to something bigger. Great. Yeah, I think I'd echo the... The, the marketing plan. I think that, you know, you've certainly had, and it needs to include the industries that are out there. I know, uh, you know, David Miller was going to be on the panel. You've got Sail Drone here, you've got Consberg here, you have MedOcean. I mean, they're the companies that are involved in this business now. And they're involved because they see a reason to be involved. So I would really lean on them to help you in this marketing and, and trying to figure that out. You know, I know from the Marine Technology Society, we are pleased to continue to be involved and continue to help spread that word because, you know, we, we are not, you know, we're, we're across all of the various sectors. Uh, so we're certainly um, able to do what we can to help spread that word. But I think your, you know, your cost estimate, it gives you a target, 
it gives you a plan. And um, so getting that out and marketed um, and, and bringing a wider audience to that marketing plan is, I think, a, a great next step. Well, thank you. And uh, I think we should conclude this session. We've got uh, still a pretty full afternoon to go. But I sincerely, I think all of us sincerely appreciate all of your perspectives and your expertise and your intellect on uh, this challenge that we have ahead of us. And this is going to be an amazing journey. And I uh, really welcome your passion and commitment and support. So thank you very much. And thank you for being on the panel today. Uh, so in terms of schedule, I think we do have a short break, if I understand correctly, 15, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, a 30 minute break while well, you've been sitting for an hour and a half. So let's take a break, network, get some coffee and stuff. And then when we come back, uh, I just want to make maybe uh, organize yourselves. Uh, we're going to we're going to roll the world's smallest projector out here into the middle of the room. And uh, so it might block your view from the phenomenal presentations that we have this afternoon. So just want to put that on your mind. But we're going to get started at three o'clock sharp when we come back. Thanks.
traditional presentation style, but please uh, use your use uh, the Slido app if you're in the audience, or uh, it, or we'll be able to ask questions at the end of each presentation at the microphones. So first, I'd like to invite uh, Ken Ch Childress up here from uh, Terra Depth Incorporated. Ken is, has more than 25 years of technical business experience in systems and data acquisition and development projects involving sustainable marine autonomous platforms. He's a founder and director of Ocean Aero Incorporated, a startup developing unique wind and solar powered autonomous ocean platforms where he functioned as a chief operations and financial officer responsible for day-to-day -day operation and managing relationships with Teledyne and Lockheed Martin. And then he joined TerraDepth in late 2018 as Chief Operations Officer, assisting with daily biz, uh, operations and business uh, operations. Uh, now Ken is the Chief Revenue Officer and is responsible for customers facing activities, including, including business development, partner relations, marketing, and product development roadmaps. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Okay, hey, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Appreciate that. Um, I just kind of jump right into it. So Teradepth is uh, developing a, a, a bathymetric um, geospatial system that we call Absolute Ocean. And this is a, a picture of it. It's kind of a, a Google Ocean or Google Map type of an approach, graphical user interface. As you look at this, uh, each one of the dots on there rep actually represents a survey. The surveys come from a lot of different sources. Some of them come from public sources like NOAA. Some of them come from other private sources. There's different types of data on there. There's bathymetric data, side scan data, SAS data, satellite data. And all of that data is blended into you know, a single interface that we can uh, use to present and manage the data. What I wanna talk about today, a little more specifically, I'll get into a little bit of the platform here in a second, but the idea of acquiring data in a crowdsourced fashion and then being able to quickly use a platform like this to move that data from the sourcing into the system and back out to the user interface so that it can be seen and viewed on a regular basis and people can really get an idea of how things are changing and how things are working in a particular area. So, we'll just... Advance it that way. So without going too much into it, basically though the, the platform Absolute Ocean is designed to be a data management platform. People can put the data into it. The data can be organized, used, planned, put into user groups, shared, annotated, resource, uploaded, downloaded, and moved about as needed so that there's a collaborative capability there created. And from a search standpoint, we can conduct different types of searches. So for example, if you want to find shipwrecks, right? Be able to put into the, into the search bar shipwrecks and it will start populating the globe with, uh, with maps that it sees out there that have identified shipwrecks in them or that, something to that effect. It's also able to balance or look for other types of features. We're doing uh, what we call target recognition in it, which is just what it says, being able to identify different targets of value and then annotate those inside the system so that they can be searched for, looked and, and used. And uh, it, you know, quality assurance, and it's also a mobile ready platform. It works on pads, phones, computers, whatever you want to get to, because effectively it's a cloud native browser based system that doesn't require any type of third party software to view, manipulate, share, change, and operate um, the data that's inside. So some of the types of data that we currently have in there include things like bathymetry from NOAA, side scan sonar imagery. This is stuff we've collected ourselves or got from others that have collected side scan. We have a partnership now with a company called T-Carta that provides satellite bathymetry. They've got a lot of very interesting satellite bathymetry in shallow water areas around the world, which 
can be very applicable in some of the coastal areas of the Great Lakes. Um, and then we also have some very high resolution data that's collected through things like synthetic aperture sonar from organizations like Kraken and Klein and others that do very high resolution data collection. So we pretty well span the whole spectrum of data type. And we also can work with other data sets uh, like water column data, METOC data, that type of stuff to overlay it into the system and provide different perspectives. So we're really making a really good case here for why we need to map the Great Lakes. This is right now uh, the most recent view of what NOAA has publicly available on their website. This is the Great Lake data that we were able to import and put in, and that is uh, all the files that we could find. So I think the estimation of about 7% was pretty close. I heard that earlier today, and I know there's other data sources out there that we haven't tapped, but I wanted to give everybody kind of a visual idea of, you know, what we're really faced <laughs> with when we come to mapping the Great Lakes. So this is the Chicago area, believe it or not, one of the denser areas in terms of data that's available. And then we can get even a, a little more drilled down and look at this as the Navy Pier area. And you look at the metadata on the side over there and note that this is a NOAA file and that it was done in 2005. So that was the most recent bathymetric data we could find of the immediate area here. And you see it's a single beam loose survey, so it's not really quite up to the type of uh, standards that we're talking about here with regard to data resolution. So what's our point? We started a little project we called Tugboat. We were approached by a couple of the port uh, in a couple of the ports in the state of Texas, Galveston, Houston, and said, hey, we have a problem with, you know, change over time. Stuff gets in the way. We have to go in and dredge. We don't always know when this is doing it, so we just schedule it. So we said, all right, well, how about we do a little experiment? So we created our own little data logger, <clears throat> same way other people have created crowdsourced data loggers, just a simple interface into, you know, the uh, common sonar, fish finder, depth indicator, anything that will give us a depth output on a standard NEMA interface, and then connected a 4G cellular modem and a Wi-Fi interface. And you can see it's a six inch by three inch by two inch thing. So it was pretty easy to put it on some boats and get it out there, get it interfaced and start collecting some depth data. So as you know, it's a dimensional world. So once you have depth and you have location, you can start plotting points. And so that's what we did. Uh, we went through the uh, real-time data collection process where you know, we collected the data location and depth every 1.5 seconds, and that would be logged back to the system in the cloud over the 4G network. And then you know, we'd coordinate the depth and data and start building a sense of a map. The first thing we do is generate some track lines. You can see the lines there in the, in the third representation. So that we're actually like tracking the boat. We could go in and point to each one of those and it would tell us the actual location of the boat and the depth in that particular area. So then we started to run them through a, a process of generating what began to look like a bathymetric map, right? So we're color coding it. And you can see in this line over here, and that's actually out of an interface into our cesium system that goes into absolute ocean. So this whole, this whole process from ping to here, we could do almost automatically and the data would appear inside the cesium interface, literally if we wanted to within minutes of having been located on the vessel, right? Or we could store the data and forward it later and build the maps a little bit as they came in. So we thought, well, we need some kind of ground truth so this is an R2 sonic representation or an actual multi-beam of Lake Travis in the dam area. We've done a lot of work on Lake Travis. We're in Austin, Texas. It's basically our test bed. We test all of our sonar systems as well as our AUVs that we run. We run Gavia 1000 AUVs as well as a large bespoke AUV that we're working on. So we do a lot of the data collection ourselves, And we also have a surface vessel that we work a lot with the R2 sonic folks out there to do different types of collection, but we needed some ground truth. So we took a high resolution uh, multi-beam from Lake Travis and we started there. So the first step, of course, is to collect data points. So we put the, put the data logger on, we just plugged it into our depth finder on our own survey vessel, and then started driving around Lake Travis and collecting data. So you can see the data points, some of them are a little denser than others. And uh, the larger points here represent two places that, you know, we got shots and the, uh, more shots than one. So we kind of started compiling the data and you can see the first rough 
formation of some type of a bathymetric representation here, color coding depth based on just the dot locations. So then it got way out of my depth in terms of what happened next, but I'm gonna to try to explain it to you. So then we have to reconstruct the data. The idea was to do a comparison of various methods of reconstructing data based on sparse point collection. And so we interpolated the data, um, completed a comparison of a number of different methods, basically to see which ones began to render the type of output that we wanted to see. Because when then we were gonna go ahead and take that output, do some further processing and turn it into a bathymetric map. So we wanted a good baseline that we felt was gonna be as accurate as possible. So again, we're comparing it back against that bathymetric survey that we did earlier. And we're looking for points of reference like islands, outputs, reaches, inflows, the kind of things we could identify quickly as we rendered and re-rendered the data as it came in. So there was other things, of course, accu accuracy and visual appeal were a big deal, right? You wanna be able to see it, you wanna know it's as accurate as possible. And then the time to compute was also a big deal. So bringing these things in, wanted to be able to run them through the system as quickly as possible. And then each method, of course, gave us a different surface or a different output to look at. So we had to just, you know, do some kind of, you know, thumb in the wind estimation of what we thought would look the best when we rendered it up, ran it into cesium and put it into AO so that it could be visualized. So as we continued the process, you know, we went through the different interpolation techniques, but the point to this is we did it dynamically. So for instance, to begin with, we maybe had X number, X number of, uh, of points, and then we had more, and each time we would add points, we would render it again, which would give us a better rendering, and each time we got a better rendering, it became more comparable to the high-density multi-beam that we started with. And then finally, we were able to come up with a surface reconstruction where we connected the dots, created a smooth linear uh, relationships that gave us a nice flowing output based on you know, common processes, but at the same time, the ones that we thought worked best in our particular application. So once we got it all put together, we actually ended up with a map that represented itself pretty well with regard to comparison to the uh, high-res multi-beam that we started with. So, the message is the more dots, the better it gets. The second message is it, this kind of stuff can be used in areas where it may not be you know, cost effective or efficient to run multi-beam surveys, but yet there are ways to collect crowdsource data, run it through a system and then put it up in a way that can be easily visualized. And every time somebody logs on to our system and sees this, they see the newest representation based on the data points that have been uploaded into the system every time it happens. So. Just wanted to give you a little run by on how something like that might actually be used in an environment like this. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions on Slido or in the chat? Any questions in the audience? You mean I had two more minutes? <laughs> I guess I I'm interested to, so, uh, your system, the system that you laid out at the beginning, that sort of, it, it seems like it's scraping data and bringing it into a common uh, geospatial viewing platform. That's one method, yeah. Is, uh, is ground truth data also incorporated in that? Drop camera, imagery, video? It can could, all could, be, could it be? It could be, yes, as a matter of fact. And we've experimented with all types. I mean, not just sonar data, but we have experimented with imagery. We're doing work with magnetometers. We're doing work with sub-bottom profiling and you know, just, just about anything that we can turn into a point cloud, uh, we can one way or another represent it in absolute ocean. And is that a resource that we would access in the, like through the internet in the cloud somewhere? Yep, www.ao.teradep.com. That's not publicly available yet, but that'll be the URL when we release the system in June. And yeah, it'll be available through any browser to a certain degree, and it'll be with regard to elements we have partners who put data in there. Some of that data, you know, will be lower represent or lower resolution representations of higher resolution data that they're selling or other things like that. So there'll be a lot of different ways to access AO in the near future. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ken. Great. You're welcome. All right. Next, next we'll hear from uh, Julian Desrochers. Uh, Julian is uh, 
for more than five years. Julian has, do you mind pulling up your presentation? I'll introduce you. Thank you. Uh, for more than five years, Julian has worked in the field of hydrography. He was a specialist in marine geomatics at SIDCO and has been the director of operations at M2 Ocean for the past two years. Over the years, Julian has accumulated experience on different types of hydrographic projects to perform the integration and calibration of hydrographic systems, as well as the acquisition and processing of data. In addition, he has a particular interest in developing collaborative bathymetry in remote areas. He is, holds a bachelor's in geomatics from Laval University in Quebec, and has completed a course in hydrographic surveying. Uh, thank you very much. And here's uh, your microphone, and then I think it should work, or not. Okay, I use the space bar. All right. Thank you everybody for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, speak today. Uh, so I'll, I'll, today I'll talk about opportunities for collaborative bathymetry uh, for the Great Lakes. Uh, just trying to figure it out how to change slides. Okay, all right, I got it. So uh, the slides don't, uh, space bar doesn't seem to work. Return. Whoa, that just created a new slide. Uh, all right. No, that's all right. Okay, that might be the issue. I'll close mine and then reopen it. They're all open, but... Uh, All right, I think we got it. Okay. All right, so uh, we've been talking about uh, how much the Great Lakes have been mapped. So here's a map of the data density. I found on the GLOSS website, it's about 5%. So uh, again, it's not that much. Uh, here uh, we can see uh, the CHS uh, coverage, freely available data. We saw in the last presentation, uh, the, uh, the NOAA. Uh, coverage. So uh, we can see again that there's not that many cover, not that much coverage. Uh, in the next slide here, we see uh, all the First Nation communities around the Great Lakes. Uh, so again, you'll understand why I'm talking about uh, these communities. And a question we need to ask ourselves is, can the mariners from the local communities safely navigate in those areas? All right, so we'll, we'll be talking about collaborative bathymetry. Just to give you an overview, I'll give you an overview about M2 Ocean, what collaborative bathymetry is for us, the technology to use, uh, the RVIT use case, data dissemination, what we've been doing uh, in that field, and opportunities for the Great Lakes. So M2 Ocean, basically, it's a spin-off from CITCO created in 2018. Uh, CITCO, which is an R&D uh, organization in marine geomatics based in Eastern Canada. Um, so basically, CITCO develops technology uh, and M2 Ocean commercializes that technology. And the M2 Ocean objective is to offer innovative technological solutions to the maritime community for mapping the lake bed slash seabed. We've got different products, the Hydro Ball, the Hydro Block, and the Hydro Tom. We offer different services, so product sales, technical support, and customized training. Uh, and also specialized hydrographic objectives. So collaborative bathymetry, what is it? So uh, CSB is a collection of uh, depth measurements from vessels using standard navigation instruments while engaged in routine maritime operations. So that's the official uh, definition from, from B12, uh, the IHO document. But uh, for us, you know, we, we, we want to add more to CSB and we, we propose a more collaborative bathymetry approach. So that's by using uh, TCSB systems, so pre-qualified systems, uh, which I'll talk a bit about uh, in the later slides. And we want to collaborate with local communities, provide training and support so they can acquire some data, have a streamlined data processing procedures and uh, provide products that are meaningful to the users. Um, so, uh, what technology to use to, uh, to acquire this data? So, we propose uh, an easy-to-use hydrographic system developed by CITCO. 
allowing the collection of TCSB. So TCSB for trusted crowdsource bathymetry. So systems that will allow to uh, collect data that is of higher quality than, for instance, a typical data logger that collects, you know, the, the position from the ship, the sonar from the ship. So we have an accurate GNSS receiver. Uh, so we installed uh, on vessels of opportunity. Um, and so basically it's a pre-qualified systems. The offsets are known. The sonar is easy to configure. Uh, we have accurate uh, vertical positioning to the ellipsoid and uh, attitude measurements for roll and pitch. I've just noticed that uh, the formatting of the presentation is not very good. So I'll go to the PDF and uh, uh, that'll make it a bit better. Just give me a second. Oh, maybe that. All right, so that means that I won't see it, right? Or I mean, on the screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, that's fine. That's all right. Okay, so here we are. Okay, uh, so yeah, that's it for that slide. So the technology we use is the HydroBlock. Uh, next, so here I'll present the uh, the the RVET use case. So uh, RVET is a community in uh, northern Canada. You can see on the bottom right, uh, it's where the little red circle is, and on the bottom we see the Great Lakes. So uh, RVET, it's a community where uh, harvesting marine wildlife uh, is essential for the community. Uh, the hunters navigate uh, on the water through areas that are poorly mapped or uh, when I say poorly mapped, it's either there's absolutely no data and there's also the fact that there's post-glacial rebound over there. So uh, the seafloor is rising. So lo lots of problems to, uh, for them to navigate. And um, so, you know, they figured out that, that problem and they want to find a way to, uh, to solve it. So, you know, a, a a key approach to uh, the Akumovic Society, which is based in Narviet, is to use research to build good evidence for strong programming. And the emphasis, the emphasis is on unleashing the capacity within our community to achieve our, our wellness goal. So basically they identified a problem and uh, they wanna figure out a way to solve it themselves. So what better way uh, than collaborative bathymetry? So basically M2Ocean, uh, we uh, provided uh, some remote and on-site training uh, for the past two summer seasons. And uh, we provide customized uh, training and support, you know, for uh, survey planning. It's, the systems are easy to use. You, you, you press the button, it, it records data, but, you know, uh, in their case, they want to do a more systematic approach. So, you know, uh, run some survey lines at a certain distance and, and then learning to install the systems on their vessels, uh, learning how to operate them, uh, you know, good survey practices, um, and then, you know, the main is troubleshooting and uh, even introduce them to data processing. Uh, so for the past two summer seasons, they've acquired uh, a few data sets. Uh, one of them on the lower left is actually an area that had never been mapped, but is, is of interest to them, you know, because they go fishing over there and they want to make sure that they get there safely. So they took it, took it upon themselves to map that area. And then uh, the other area uh, up top is an area that uh, had already been mapped by CHS, but I think maybe 30 or 40 years ago. And, you know, I was talking about post-glacial rebound, you know, the seabed is changing. So they wanted to check, you know, how much it has changed and how it can impact their navigation. Uh, so in terms of uh, data quality assessment, uh, basically we've, uh, you know, uh, processed the data and, you know, with, uh, cross-line validation, uh, we've been able to uh, to conclude that this data respects IHO uh, S44 special order 1A or uh, TVU or better and CHS assess the data to be uh, of CADSOC B. So uh, obviously that tells us that, you know, this, this data is of good quality enough uh, to help these uh, mariners navigate. And in terms of uh, product uh, dissemination, you know, we've uh, disseminate the data to, to different parties. Uh, first and foremost, the, the community who, who, who wants to use that data, 
uh, we've provided, uh, you know, bathymetric charts, paper charts, those are nice, but uh, we've also, uh, the data is now available on the SQL app, which I'll show a bit lower down, uh, which will allow them to help navigate. And then to CHS, we provided the process soundings. And then uh, to the DCDB, we've just contri contributed uh, the data they, they acquired to the DCDB, which is the, uh, I guess, the host of all CSB data for, uh, for the world. Uh, so that's an example of a bathymetric chart that was provided to the community. And what's nice, you know, we try to add a special touch and, you know, all the people, community members who contributed to the map are uh, uh, listed on it. Uh, and then there's also the, uh, the part that's, to me, really interesting and really closing the loop of, you know, uh, these people acquired the data, but... Uh, now that it's available on, on an application, they can actually uh, use it to, uh, to navigate. So Siku, it's, uh, it's a social net network for indigenous communities. And uh, basically, uh, it's the Facebook of indigenous communities for the north. And on there, there's a bunch of information they can post, you know, when, what they observe, for instance, you know, if they see some, some wildlife, you know, they can post a picture about it. And uh, recently, Siku integrated uh, the CHS uh, bathymetric data, so the contours and then shoals and, and stuff like that. But they've also integrated uh, the data that this community collected. And uh, that's the, the part you see on the on the far right. Uh, so basically, currently, there's still ice up there. So they haven't had the opportunity to use it for navigation. But what we believe is, you know, once, you know, the, the people from the community uh, who, who almost all use that app, well, then when they'll go out and navigate it, well, okay, here, we're serving, we're, we're going to find our fish or, or whatever. And then uh, it's actually us who, who map that area. And I think that's, that's pretty cool. And hopefully other communities will want to start and uh, engage in doing that. So uh, just in terms of the results for the community so far, I mean, it's an ongoing project, but, uh, you know, the local community was able to build capacity to, uh, to measure the seafloor, uh, the training and the hydroblock systems provided uh, by M2 Ocean allowed them to develop skills to acquire quality hydrographic data. Uh, and then, you know, the community is now able to uh, conduct uh, hydrographic surveys with minimal assistance. And, you know, uh, the new skills will allow to uh, the validation of community knowledge uh, with science and ensure safer navigation. So, you know, basically uh, all the members of this community have been observing, you know, oh, before there wasn't a show over there, but, you know, what's, what's happened, you know, the, the earth is rising. Well, now, you know, they can actually verify that with the data they're, they're acquiring. So in terms of oppor opportunities for the Great Lakes and, and how that could translate over here, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, for, for indigenous communities, well, they could, you know, build capacity uh, in lake mapping for their communities. So all the indigenous communities in the Great Lakes, you know, uh, if they feel they have a need, you know, to, to, to have more information uh, of the lake bed in their area, uh, well, they, they, they could start learning that and that would contribute to their self-development. And, uh, you know, like for Arviat, eventually that, that data could end up uh, on, a, on an application for them to help them navigate, because obviously they don't have chart plotters or don't use ENCs and, and stuff like that. So a simple application that helps them navigate would, would really be beneficial. And, you know, hopefully uh, we help uh, spread the word to other communities in the Great Lakes to engage in, in collaborative uh, bathymetry, because, you know, like a lot of people have said here today, uh, it, it's not only one, one method that would, you know, help solve this, you know, mapping of the Great Lakes. We need to use all the possible initiatives, and we believe uh, collaborative bathymetry is one of them. And also, you know, uh, this is targeted towards indigenous communities, but we can think of any community who would want to, uh, to map in their area. For instance, little harbors, you know, who have people who would want to engage and, and, and do this stuff. You don't have to be an expert to start collecting data. Uh, I mean, we believe it's really, uh, you know, anybody can start doing that. So uh, that's all. Thank you very much. We have time for one quick question for Julian. If anyone has one in the room or on Slido in the back, no? 
uh, one question I have is, um, so with, you know, crowdsource bathymetry is one thing, but these are probably fishing communities to a great extent. And is there, pro is, what do you see as like the potential to extend the, from bathymetry to habitat mapping or some sort of derived uh, product that relates to fish habitats or something like that? Mm, I mean, I'm going to switch this over while you, while you answer. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's definitely something that's possible. Even uh, uh, with the, the research center we're, we're associated with, we, we actually uh, did that stuff with, with multi-beam and geomorpho geomorphometry. So uh, basically, we could have uh, people, uh, you know, collecting high density uh, single beam data and um, possibly test the algorithms that have been developed for the multi-beam. And, you know, that could eventually um, be used to, uh, you know, uh, characterize the seabed. And uh, another thing is, you know, depending if our provided sonar uh, is used, well, we can collect backscatter data. So that, that could also eventually, uh, you know, help for the, for the habitat mapping. I mean, that, I guess, area hasn't been uh, pushed a lot yet, but it's definitely something that's possible. Thank you very much. Great, I'd like to invite Olivia Hughes from Bedrock Ocean Exploration. Uh, Olivia is a geospatial engineer uh, that works out of San Diego. In her role at Bedrock, Olivia is part of the data team where she works closely with the survey operations and cloud engineering teams. She specifically follows the data from collection to client deliverables. Uh, prior to Bedrock, Olivia gained experience in, with unmanned systems through operations of various AUV and ROV platforms and specialize in mission planning, data processing, and data delivery. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Gloss, for providing this opportunity to speak. The theme of this year's event is building the great map, which is especially relevant as we're creeping closer to the lake bed 2030 goal to have the entirety of the Great Lakes mapped in high density by 2030. I think a lot of you already know why we need to map the Great Lakes, but data drives informed decision making and the greater detailed map that we have, the better we can be at making these decisions. Where are their cultural resources and how should we preserve them? There's quite a lot of maritime heritage on the beds of these lakes and there's so much more that can be uncovered. There's critical infrastructure that needs to be inspected and mapped in detail. There's benthic habitat that needs to be characterized and detailed. So many stakeholders need and want this information. And of course, this information needs to be easily accessible and publicly available to these stakeholders to use in this decision making. Um, so how are we going to achieve our goal of mapping uh, the lake bed by 2030? And I believe that we'll only achieve this goal whenever we start to adopt new technologies, especially when these technologies are scalable and economical. Um, so AUVs or autonomous underwater vehicles, for those of you that aren't familiar, are a way that we can create a complete map most economically. And when I say complete map, I mean multiple sensors like multi-beam, side scan, and magnetometers. Um, man portable AUVs require a small footprint. Uh, it's lightweight. You can have fast mobilization and demobilization and having the ability to maintain constant depth or constant altitude often creates data that's more accurate than maybe its towed counterpart. AUVs are far less susceptible to weather days and surface influence in the data and many AUVs are electric and green solutions. I'm sure that many of you have seen this image now, um, breaking down the data density in the Great Lakes. Uh, I'm a visual learner, and I wanted to dig in a little bit deeper into a point I made on the last slide about depth and altitude. Um, so there's the Great Lakes. It's a little hard to see with the, the lighting, <laughs> but that box that you can see is located in a region that had pretty low data density. And I pulled out that data into a box from uh, Lake Superior from the Jebco grid to kind of make a visual representation of what I meant whenever I was talking about that. These are my art skills. <laughs> um, when an AUV maintains constant depth or altitude, your mapping sensors are consistently much closer to the lake bed than they would be in a towed or hull mounted survey. And if you have the same beam angle in your multi-beam, um, 
those beams spread out with depth and you lose resolution. So when you're able to maintain a constant altitude from the lake bed, you're able to maximize the performance of that sensor and collect data with a higher resolution and fewer passes. Similarly with side scan sonar, you have the ability to maintain that altitude sweet spot so you can have better quality in your data and resolve objects in the data much better. And magnetometry uh, is also largely distance dependent. So the closer that you are to the lake bed, the more fine grain objects that you're gonna be able to detect. I talked a lot about AUVs in general, but I did wanna highlight bedrock specifically and speak to who we are, what our vision is for a lot of these solutions. And as you can read here, our mission is to accelerate underwater exploration by developing the technology needed to build the most accessible and complete data set available. Our vision is explore, sustain, and to support all life. I'd also like to highlight that we are a public benefit corporation. So, you know, we, it is part of our values to give back to the communities that we're supporting. So Bedrock builds AVs um, that are specifically designed, purpose-built to collect data to result in a complete map of a lake bed in a single mission. So that includes the whole sensor suite of multi-beam, side scan, and magnetometer data. Uh, our AV is man portable and lightweight. I can carry it. Uh, and it's uh, launchable with a really small footprint, small boat, two people, one person. You can launch it from shore. Um, but something that is unique about Bedrock is our vertically integrated survey platform. So when data is collected with our AUV, uh, it gets put into our cloud native platform called Mosaic. Early on, we realized that a hydrographic survey is a big data problem. And the only way to solve that is with innovative technology. So Mosaic is a solution um, to provide you know, a way to answer these big data issues. Anyone who's worked with sonar files knows how much of a pain it is to share and often view these files. So you have to have a large hard drive to ship it, or you have to have some kind of proprietary sonar processing platform, or you have to be able to code. And Mosaic allows you to upload raw sonar data and share that data. And it's also a repository for open data that can be shared publicly for free. So any one of you could create an account on Mosaic. And if you're willing to contribute your data uh, for the public, it's completely free to share and store that data there and visualize it. So this is an example of a public survey in Mosaic. The green indicates the footprints of the individual sonar swaths. And if you'd like to explore the data even more, you can toggle on the track lines, which will reveal the heading, speed, and time if that information was in the raw sonar file. And one more click allows you to visualize the raw MBES data itself. And again, all it takes is requiring uh, you to upload a multi-beam file and it is going to map it for you. Pretty user-friendly. And uh, with another click, you can see the process data if it's available for this survey. So this is a process geotiff in uh, Suisun Bay. And then uh, here's an image of the process side scan data. So if you have sonar data that you wanna share publicly, or if you're looking for a cloud-based solution for sharing and visualizing sonar data with a client, then you should check out Bedrock. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you very much, Olivia. Yeah. Uh, any questions in the audience or on Slido? Or can I keep, should I just keep generating questions out of my head? I can. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Here. So uh, I'm wondering about the math involved in the number of AUVs that it would take to map something the size of, oh, say, Lake Michigan in the space of a year. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, um, something that is cool about Bedrock is uh, the scalability. So we will have a fleet of AVs that are able to like collaboratively map. So you'd be able to cover a lot more grounds. It really would depend on like the primary sensor that you were interested in. If you were interested in a full multi-beam survey that 
is going to be probably a little bit easier than if you wanted to collect with like your primary sensor being a magnetometer and you're looking for something at a specific resolution. Same with side scan. So uh, if you can maximize uh, what you're mapping, you can do it a lot faster, but a real time estimate, I don't know. <laughs> but definitely something we could probably figure out. I have a couple questions. Um, so the question is, what is the optimal depth from bottom and the depth limitations for shallow water with AUVs? So I think both what is, what shall, how shallow is too shallow? Um, and I'll let you answer that, sorry. With AUVs specifically, I mean, I have used AUVs to shallow in a meter or less of water uh, using shore avoidance. So I think that, you know, as, as long as you're comfortable with maybe your AUV going on shore, you could get as close as you want. Uh, but uh, yeah, there, there are definitely depth, depth limitations. Like I said, your um, resolution is gonna degrade with depth. So with an AUV, you're limited to the depth rating of the vehicle. Our AUV is rated to 200 meters. That doesn't mean that you can't map deeper than 200 meters. It just means that the AUV shouldn't go beyond 200 meters. Um, and then there are AUVs, there are large class AUVs that are able to go much deeper and to map uh, far deeper than ours. So I think that AUVs in general really open up uh, a lot of opportunity for where you can map from shallow all the way to deep and finding the platform that is gonna answer the questions that you have is, is very possible with AUVs in general. How shallow is too shallow for bedrock AUVs is the question. Um, I, I mean, I would feel pretty confidently that we have uh, surveyed in one meter of water, so I wouldn't want to go much closer. <laughs> All right. And then um, this is a question about AUVs in general is do they measure other hydrospatial parameters than bathy? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we also have like a, a CTD on board. Um, so you could run a specific mission that was going to collect CTD data if that was something you were interested in. And a lot of AVs um, outside of our AV and including our AV often have an auxiliary port that allows you to collect or connect additional sensors. So, you know, you could always strap something on as long as it can come in through a, a port connection and you can um, map additional sensors. But our AEV specifically has a multi-beam echo sounder, side scan sonar transducers, and a magnetometer. And then we also have an additional payload that has a sub-bottom profiler. Um, so those were kind of our two options, or our two payload options uh, at Bedrock, but there are definitely more out there with other AEVs. All right, thank you so much, Olivia. Uh, very interesting. I have some follow-up questions after the, after the, after the hour. Uh, great. Um, let me change the presentation out. Wonderful. All right. Our last presentation for the hour is uh, by Brian Conan, Vice President for Ocean Mapping at Saildrum. I suspect, Brian, you might have a different perspective that AUVs are the only solution for mapping underwater, but we'll, we'll hear about that in a second here. Uh, so Captain Brian Conan, uh, U.S. Navy retired, became pre Vice President of Ocean Mapping at SailDrone in December 2020. Certified hydrographer, holds a BS in geography from University of South Carolina, MS from in Oceanography and Meteorology from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, and MS in Hydrography from the University of Southern Mississippi. He's a chartered marine scientist in hydrography and a fellow at the Institute for Marine Engineering Science and Technology served over 28 years as a Navy oceanographer and hydrographer and is passionate about mapping as we're about to hear. Thank you very much, Brian. It seems like this isn't working. This okay. is and maybe spacebar. Okay. All right, quick quiz, where at, where's the sail drone? Where, but where geographically is it? Come on. Thank you, we got a winner. Who said that? You get a free pen. Well, everybody gets a free pen. Okay, Brian Conan, uh, really glad to be here. Thanks, thanks for inviting us up. I'm um, gonna talk to you about, a little bit about, you know, sail drone, who we are, but then I, you know, my brief might've been better in the last session, because I'm gonna talk a little bit about strategy um, and just the, the scope of the challenge we have here. So sail drone, uh, located out in Alameda, California is our headquarters. We also have an office in St. Pete, Florida. 
On the right hand side, you can see a lineup of our Explorer drones, which are not mapping unless you're doing single beam. Um, and then on the left, you can see one outside next to our biggest drone, which is a 72 footer uh, that can map all the way down to 7,000 meters. Um, very environmentally friendly. We use the wind for propulsion. And so this is how we get that long endurance that really makes uh, the sail drone attractive uh, to a lot of us. Um, we've been at out there for a while. Um, this is a proven technology. So we've done 17,000 days at sea um, and gone over uh, 750,000 nautical miles around the world. We've surveyed, never, surveyed and collected data in every ocean. Uh, we've crossed the Atlantic a number of times. So don't believe that the Mayflower one says that they're doing it first. We've already done it. Um, and we weren't the first either. Um, and again, we can be anywhere um, in the world from in about 30 days with the, with the explorers. Three missions, ocean data, ocean mapping, maritime domain awareness. Um, obviously, we're going to focus on the ocean mapping piece here. Uh, but our ocean data mission is something that we've done in the Great Lakes uh, last year. We're doing it in this year with Pete. Um, so working with USGS and doing fishery surveys uh, using our Explorer drones. So we were in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron um, last year. This year, uh, still working on exactly where we're going to be. Uh, but again, going to be up here in, in collecting uh, biomass of, of fish uh, using the WBT Mini, which is a version of the Simrad EK80 uh, system. So uh, really excited to be working up in the Great Lakes. It's perfect conditions for us because you tend to have a lot of wind up here most of the time, uh, which is good for the sail drone. And uh, it's been great working with uh, his team at USGS as well. So how do we do mapping? I mentioned for the Explorer, we can do single beam and we've done a lot of that up in the Arctic for uh, NOAA the last couple of years. We've done about seven years in the Arctic, so we can work around ice and in uh, some pretty uh, interesting weather conditions. Um, on the right is the big one, and then right in the middle is the Voyager, which is a mid-sized vehicle with a shallow water multi-beam system that we're working on right now. Uh, prototypes are in the water, and we'll begin actual production of those uh, this summer. So why do we need to map it? I mean, I see stuff like this, and it's already mapped. We've got great, you know, colorful imagery that shows that the Great Lakes have been mapped. Um, but in fact, um, as we look at the, the NOAA, at least the U.S. side, this is what NOAA considers to have been mapped. And so that includes a lot of LIDAR data along the shore um, and little patchwork pieces around uh, that tend to get funded um, every few years. You know, maybe they'll send a survey ship in. A lot of work by contractors here in the Great Lakes, uh, which is, is great. Um, but again, we're missing a whole lot of information. Um, we, it is fairly shallow in, in perspective to mapping an ocean. Um, you, you've got some conditions that are good for LIDAR and satellite drive bathymetry, but not ideal, but you can get some out of that. Um, you do have a little bit of weather up here, especially in the, in the shoulder months. And uh, of course you do get ice on a number of the lakes. <clears throat> now that is changing, or we're seeing a lot more of the lakes are ice free year round which means we could be surveying year round, um, but we don't, right? Because we're using crude vessels that go out and they um, you know, can't run away as fast as they need to from those weather events that come through. A lot of commercial traffic. We've got the international boundaries with the, those crazy Canadians to the north like Denny. Um, and it's a very large area to survey. Now I was talking to Meredith earlier. Uh, this is basically a brief, same kind of brief I was giving to her Alaska group um, very similar kind of things, although her scale is much, much larger. Uh, there's a lot more uh, water to, to survey up there. But, you know, right now we consider the survey window to be short. Is it May to November? Um, because you're trying to schedule ship assets. Uh, so you want to make sure you get the ship up there when you can survey. You don't want to be waiting uh, for weather conditions or ice to recede to survey. So you really get limited by uh, the time frame that you can survey. Um, can we do 180 days? Could we go longer? Is it shorter? A lot of years, it could be longer. Some years, it might be shorter. Um, if you're relying on a ship that's not in the Great Lakes, then um, that really does compress your timelines as well. Um, there is a lot of, uh, of shallow areas, and there's also a lot of areas that are pretty far from a port. And so if you have a system that has to uh, come back in to refuel or recharge, uh, that transit time is dead survey time. You need to be able to stay out longer. And that's the advantage that something like a sail drone brings to the fight in that we can be out for months at a time. We can stay out there uh, mapping for 30, 60, 90 days, uh, depending on uh, conditions. 
So that kind of gets to that last one. Uh, really need systems that have a long endurance and um, can survive storms. So if you haven't checked out the booth, I can show you the video of a sail drone inside of a hurricane, Cat 4 hurricane, so we can survive pretty well um, in most weather. But let's talk a little bit about the ice coverage. And it's been mentioned here um, as of Friday, I guess, when I put this together, you can see what the ice concentration was out there now. So we're pretty much ice free. Um, and this is getting earlier and earlier than year from what I can tell. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of good analysis and modeling that goes on to talk about the ice in the Great Lakes. So why aren't we surveying right now? As someone told me earlier, this is the perfect time to survey. Um, there's no one out there because it's still too cold to be out there very much um, and conditions are pretty good. So we could be surveying right now and we're not. Hey, I got to use the density thing too. <laughs> So <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so, you know, what, what kind of recommendations do we have for, for doing this work? Um, you know, kind of get all the stakeholders together. We're doing that, Lake Bed 2030. You know, fantastic job of bringing in all the folks who care about this and getting conversations on both sides of the border. Um, identify priority areas, done it, you know, we've gone along. And then now that's just the easy part to get the funding. No, it's not the easy part. Um, but plan to work with what the weather and the ice conditions are gonna give us. Be ready to survey as soon as you can. Um, you can't do that necessarily with crewed vessels, but with unmanned systems or uncrewed systems, you could. I'm a firm believer in using as much LIDAR and SDB as you can get. If it makes sense to use it, then do it. Because even for, you know, for a crewed or an uncrewed vehicle to get close to shore, just creates all kinds of problems. Now I know that you know we can take the bedrock right up onto the beach and then it'll reverse itself and something, I don't know. But, um, but it is a lot easier for all of us if we can get a little deeper, <laughs> okay? Um, I can't go shallower than say three meters. I prefer to stay 10 meters and deeper because that gives me some sea room to maneuver as well. Um, those unique or hard areas, ports and harbors approaches um, a lot of uh, buoys, um, you know, focus your crude assets in those hard areas that really require that kind of real time on the spot, being able to move around. And if those crude vessels could be using USVs or U AUVs as a force multiplier as well. And, you know, use the USVs to do that reconnaissance bathymetry to then drive where you want to go use AUVs to get down close to the bottom to give you the high resolution look especially if you're doing uh, habitat mapping, uh, wreck investigations, um, being able to survey from the surface, yes, your resolution is, le is less, but it does give you that bigger knowledge and the ability to survey a lot faster, okay? Um, and as, as Meredith said, we can scale these things quickly. We can produce USVs and UUVs much, much faster than it takes to build a whole new ship and at a much lower cost. So how do we do that? So this is the sail drone Voyager uh, bathymetry system that we're developing. Um, it's gonna have a high resolution shallow water multi-beam, currently the Norbit I-80S wing head system. Um, it will probably also have a sub-bottom profiler because this is also gonna be a workhorse in offshore wind. So bathymetry sub-bottom required. Sub-bottom is probably something folks in the Great Lakes would like to see as well. This will also collect all the same med ocean uh, parameters that we collect with our Explorer drones. And those have all been validated by NOAA. So now you've got additional in-situ weather observations on the Great Lakes to support modeling of weather events. Um, how, many, how many NOAA weather buoys are currently deployed in the Great Lakes? Anyone know? I think there's one that stays permanently. The rest of them go in and get pulled out every year because they can't survive the winter. So you have parts of the year where you do not have any in-situ observations to support weather modeling in the Great Lakes. We can be out there in any open water providing that uh, and from every one of our vehicles that survey. That was very quick. All right, now you get to guess again, where are the sail drones? There we go. All right, thank you very much. Come see me at the booth. Thank you. Last hour we have left. Yeah.
All right, I think we have time for a few questions here. Any questions from the audience or online? Okay, you recognize Mike Cal. <laughs> Any questions? Yep. The question is, is there a concern for spray ice? That's for the audience in yes. the, on, on streaming right now. Yeah. Um, uh, certainly, and I think you know we've experienced that in the Arctic, and um, we have some ways to mitigate that. But it, that would be something we would want to look at on how far in. Um, we've also toyed with the idea of just allowing our drones to get frozen in, and and let them drift as the ice moves as well. Um, so, good R and D project. One more question. Brian, what do you see as the capability for near real-time uh, observation of the, the sonar returns? Where's that, what's the horizon look like for that? Um, we're doing that now. Um, so if you are a customer with us, you have access to a mission portal um, that allows you to see your drone um, and see all the data that's coming off of it in near real-time. And for the Explorer drones, you see a time series of all the Met Ocean observations and a picture from the cameras and you see a geographic representation of the track where it's been and, and, and where it's gonna go. We added to that for the bathymetry missions is you actually get a near real-time coverage map of uh, what's coming off the sonar. And so you can see that we've got the right overlap. You can see that the data quality is good um, and really get a good idea of, of what that bathymetry has looked like. And if maybe there is an indication of a wreck, uh, then you could go on and say, hey, it looks like there was a wreck. Let's go back and look at that you know, do a rec investigation or look at some other feature. All right, uh, I could ask one more, we have one minute. So uh, my question is about so, sort of, uh, I know that this is a, pro you have a prototype in development right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder how you deal with the, the added uh, sort of attitude mm -hmm. uh, in the vehicle due to maybe strong winds and some, some conditions. Is, is, your, is the uh, foreseen multi-beam gonna be gimbaled on that? If so, do you have an expectation of tolerances of that for good yeah, data quality? So what he's re kind of referring to is on the, the explorers with the fishery sonars, the, it's a gimbaled mount and it can go 30 degrees basically to try and keep that transducer facing down. For the multi-beam systems, we really don't heal as much as you would think a sailing vessel would do. Um, and we're monitoring that data quality and we can adjust our wing and adjust our, our course so that we are not exceeding the data quality limits. And that's been a real big thing for us is, you know, survey as long as we can, but once the conditions have gotten to the point where it's too rough, we just go into basically a storm mode and we heave to and, and ride it out. And then we can get right back on survey. So we haven't had to leave the area and avoid the storm. We can just stay there and get back on survey. So didn't mention, so we've got the integrated Atlantic Spasm V on the Voyager uh, to provide that, that, you know, motion correction. Great, thank you so much. And if we could uh, give a hand to all of our speakers this hour. All right, thanks Pete for moderating that session. That was fantastic. <clears throat> we only have one more session before the real fun begins. Uh, so let's get into that. Uh, it's illuminate, it, illuminated and informed from data to insights. So this is talking about, we've got a really great panel of people coming up. So I'll invite you to come up now if you're on the panel. Stephanie Gondula with NOAA and the Thunder Bay Marine Sanctuary is gonna moderate this panel where we're talking about the whole spectrum from acquisition to accessibility. And uh, so we're really looking forward to this session. All right, Stephanie, thanks. Thank you very much. I think we have a, a few minutes for a, a scene change. So as that, um, right, David? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. So one of our panelists um, will be virtual and on the big screen here. So while we're getting the scene um, changed, I, I will thank you for the introduction, uh, Tim. And it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a maritime archeologist and the resource protection coordinator up at NOAA's Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Has anybody been there? Anybody in the audience at all? Not a soul? Oh my goodness. 
I'm failing at my job. Well, I, a perfect place sanctuaries are, especially sanctuaries in the Great Lakes to test technologies because we have quite a few shipwrecks if you'd like to uh, see what your imaging um, can do. In fact, one of the title slides up there was one of the uh, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary shipwrecks. What was that? Oh yeah, 2G robotics, right? Okay, okay. Well, I didn't realize that. So that was great to hear the, um, the, son or the laser imagery, the propeller that you may have seen up on the screen, uh, Brendan had, his company had some, something to do with that. And then we have Mary Claire on the screen. Hello, welcome. Thank you. Sorry, I can't be there in person today. Um, hopefully my head's not too much bigger than everyone else. <laughs> Mary, we can't quite hear you yet, so stand by. Thank you for your patience. So if you haven't been to Thunder Bay, it is in uh, Northwestern Lake Huron, dare I say the, the greatest of the Great Lakes. Let's get any arguments started before our reception this evening. Uh, um, Mary Claire, are you muted on your end? No, I'm, I'm not. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Well, since we are on a tight schedule while they're working through that, um, just a few more words building on what Tim said, what this panel is about really is the, the life cycle of the data, everything from um, acquisition, where we'll get to hear from, from Tammy and Brendan, to modeling, post-processing from Lyndon and public access, um, a specific innovative project that Mary Claire will share, and then Nazis work with the, um, the archival side of things, which is as important as any of it, because why would we be collecting if we can't save it for posterity and for future generations? Try it again, Mary Claire. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Wonderful to hear Yay. your voice. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, and I'm echoing a bit now. Maybe not. It's okay. It's okay. Does it sound okay to everyone in the audience? You can hear us well, Mary Claire? Yeah, I can. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. And can you see us too? I can, yeah. Excellent. Success <laughs> all around. So, so our panelists um, this afternoon, we have Tammy Frankson on the end here with Teledyne Karras, and we have Nazila Marathi with NOAA NCEI, and we have Lyndon Brinks with LOSS, and Brendan St. John from Voya Imaging Incorporated, and Mary Claire um, Buell with Collective Environmental, and she's the founder of that company. So with that, I, if I could start with Tammy, if, if you wouldn't mind just um, telling us a little bit about your role in that, where do you land in that life cycle of, of data? Absolutely. Um, since the microphone just works magic, so here we go. Yeah, I'm Tammy, I'm working with Helen Karras. Like she said, I originally started at NOAA, so I have a hydrographic survey background working on the Alaska West Coast uh, and Arctic regions is where I got started. But right now I'm a product manager uh, at Teledyne and Karras, and I manage the hydrographic products. So I work with my partner, Travis Hamilton, and he's kind of in charge of... Uh, uh, Karis Onboard, uh, the Onboard 360, which is our acquisition platform. Yeah. We have acquisition data processing and hips and sips. And then I work also into the Bathy database side, so which is also database storage um, and kind of starting to turn that data into information and then leading into the distribution side of the Karis product line. Excellent, Tammy. Thank you. And I was remiss. I did want to ask just for a real short um, little background or bio of each of, of each of the panelists today. So if you Go to that and then when you all go start with that and then tell us more specifically about your role oh yeah and uh, i mentioned i worked at NOAA, but uh, yeah. i started i did the cat a program at the university of new hampshire um have a marine geology background before hydrographic surveying and um been in the industry for 13 14 years now so wonderful thank you can you hear me okay hi my name is nazi um I work for NOAA's Center for Environmental Information. 
I am, I call myself a recovering scientist because I was a scientist or a complete natural. And I've seen um, both sides of the, the coin. So I, I know the pain of, of collecting data and I know how hard it is to get data out of the hands of scientists um, for the greater good. So I spend a lot of time advocating for for that. Um, my background is in fisheries biology. I worked for NOAA for many years and then um, as a, both a fisheries biologist and then as a data manager and then um, left and then came back to NOAA again. Um, I work again for NESDIS's uh, Centers for Environmental Information. I'm based out of Boulder and I uh, work with some of the folks here on their data. Um, I support data stewardship which is not something that we talk a lot about. Um, the, most of the folks in Colorado are working as, as scientists in a science division. So there's very little, um, little interaction with some of the data stewardship that's larger within NCI. So I spend a lot of time um, advocating for data stewardship. I call it um, mostly, I, I think of it as a state planning for your data and that you don't really necessarily, you shouldn't start at the, at the end of the process, you need to start thinking about it earlier. So that's something that I continue to press upon um, folks that I work with. Thank you. Lyndon. Uh, my name is Lyndon Brinks. I work for the Great Lakes Observing System. I'm sure you all know who we are at this point, uh, but my background is in um, geography and coastal and marine environments. And um, I actually bounced around doing terrestrial restoration for a little while. And then I was lucky enough to land a job with Gloss, and I've been working um, on initiatives like Lake Bed 2030 and advocating for mapping in the Great Lakes for the past three years. Um, and I have um, some expertise in GIS and data visualization as well. And that's where my role is <laughs> as well. Yeah, my name is Brendan St. John. Uh, I work for a company called Voyas. Uh, my background is in electro, uh, electromechanical engineering, um, focusing on robotics. So that's kind of what led me to the, the sensor side of things on autonomous platforms. Um, so at Voyas, we do underwater stills imaging and laser uh, scanning to build out high resolution models of any sub sea environment. Um, Traditionally, we're focused on the offshore oil and gas and defense sectors um, and have slowly started to transition into the, uh, the ocean science industry. Um, I don't know if you saw it earlier, but our data was displayed there. Our biggest claim to fame right now, that like you can't share the data, is we were the company that modeled um, the endurance wreck that was obviously just oh. found. So <laughs> when I get a chance, I'll, uh, I'll share that data. I'm sure you guys will see it all. But yeah, so uh, some big things happening now. Oh, that's exciting. All right, Mary Claire, it's to you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mary Claire Buell, and um, as uh, our moderator mentioned, I am founder of a small consulting firm called Selective Environmental. And a lot of the work that we actually, almost all the work we do is focused around facilitating cross-cultural environmental research and planning to support Indigenous communities. And many of our work or many of our projects are actually um, within the Great Lakes Basin. I, I, I am settler Canadian. I have uh, Irish and German ancestry. So I, I play often as sort of a, a sort of liaison between technology and Western science uh, tools and sources of information and indigenous communities and, and their knowledge holders to try to understand different environmental challenges that these communities are facing. and come up with some pretty innovative solutions. Um, and uh, currently, when you're thinking about the, the topic for this panel, I am I'm on a project that's funded by GLOSS, which we call BOMAGE, which is uh, an Anishinaabe Moen word that loosely translates to, to track or follow along. So we're using telemetry technology to track uh, Lake Whitefish, but also doing some pretty uh, fun and interesting uh, lake bed mapping around spawning shoals to characterize fish habitat and um, really get a, an idea of what's happening underwater. So we're using multi-beam sonar as well as uh, ROV. Um, and all this work is, is done in partnership with the Chippewas of uh, Nawash, Unceded First Nation. And um, through the whole pipeline of um, collecting the data, interpreting it, um, processing it, and then applying it. Uh, community members are involved. Uh, we have an internship program that 
is has been largely successful in making sure that uh, when I leave this project, they're self-sufficient with uh, tackling more areas around their territory. So I think I'll leave that there. Thank you. <clears throat> Wonderful. I can see why Gloss and, and Tim and Lyndon gathered this particular <laughs> panel together, because what a diverse group of expertise and um, really truly representing um, the life cycle of the, of the data. Uh, so, and I love the theme that we've seen throughout of um, what you termed Nazi uh, data stewardship and that accessibility, um, such an important part of what we're doing here today. So speaking of accessible information, um, that means different things to different people, of course, like what does it mean to you? And this can be a personal answer. It could be a tech, you know, technical answer. And I'll let whoever feels most ready to answer, go ahead. I mean, <laughs> I can jump on. Um, accessibility to me is, is just having access to the data without having to jump through red tape or, or hoops to get it. Um, we see it a lot in the offshore industry. Uh, you collect data and you never get to see it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it essentially goes into a void or black hole. Um, so providing that data to people who will make use of it, whether they're involved in the project or not, um, I think that's that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Um, I get my perspective and Gloss's perspective on this is I would love for the data to be um, available as like a web service. I don't even have to download it. I can just pull it up on a map online, look at it, interact with it. Maybe if I need to actually get back to the raw data, maybe I can click on it and it'll point me to it or I can um, potentially download it through there. This, for me, this is what I would love to see as the future of bathymetry and um, bottom type data sets. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So for me, it's many of the same things. So making sure the data is accessible through web services, um, other um, ports, like for example, NCI actually still has customer engagement. So you can call somebody if you have a question and they will get you to the right person which is helpful because not everyone um, has a machine, does things machine to machine um, or is comfortable necessarily clicking through to get to the data. But to make sure that the data is also accessible means that it has strong metadata and it's easily findable. And that's something that um, we really try to um, impress upon our data um, submitters and also work towards um, adding value to metadata so the data is more accessible. And that's really just to add a quick comment where the importance of doing your estate planning first right, exactly. um, comes in. Tell me a little bit about yourself. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. And I just had uh, just a little personal story in that uh, in my current position at Teledyne Caris, I, I actually struggle quite regularly with access to data because, you know, we're one of the software programs that processes so many different types of data. And as a product manager, it's my job to, you know, share what my software can do and having data to use as examples, you know, to share and demonstrate. It's, it's often difficult because getting people to share their data, I think Mike Brissett is one of the ones that, you know, I'm always constantly, hey, you got any new data I can have? I'm always, always walking around with my hard drives and looking for data through back channels. But um, and NOAA is one of the best sources because of NCEI and everything being available. But it's sometimes hard to say, hey, where's the cool data? Or, hey, where's the, the data that could demonstrate this type of you know, uh, technology best? And so it's, it's often hard to find data. So I, I come from that side of the fence where I'm always looking for it mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> always want it. Right. Give me your data. I encounter quite frequently too. Um, a lot of the customers don't give us access to the data, which then we can't build out the product uh, and better it. Um, building out algorithms for color correction and stuff like that. So having access to that data from our perspective too, not just a, a customer perspective, yeah. Wonderful. So Mary Claire, what does um, accessibility mean for you? Yeah, I kind of wanted to play off of that, the state comment, because I think that that's, when I thought about this question earlier, I was thinking, you know, purpose-led data acquisition is, um, is key to having successful data access. And so, you know, asking ourselves, why are we doing this? Who benefits? And then by identifying those who benefit, we can seek ways to have them be a part of the process, the acquisition process. And that allows them to provide input along the pipeline. So those might not necessarily have a technical background or wouldn't traditionally be the ones designing the data acquisition or being a part of it are now shaping 
what the data looks like and, and how we get it. And I think that this um, we see happening with citizen science and community engagement, but one of the gaps that show up is once the information is collected, it goes from um, sort of, okay, we've collected all this information, now it goes and is stored somewhere and we need someone with expertise to interpret it. So we're often relying on these heavy experts. So even though you're making it accessible through a freely available forum, that doesn't actually mean people can use it. And I think access is tightly linked to that as well. Um, so I kind of, I like to sort of plug like youth involvement and co-ops and internships and short-term contracts to really see out that data life cycle. And so whoever you're hoping to benefit from it actually has a sort of built-in data translator that can, can, can help use that data. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my two cents. <laughs> Um, focusing on the, um, the importance of uh, acquisition to accessibility. And sometimes, probably a lot of the time, that can take years and years and years. Any ideas or input or comments on how, and if, if we should, or I guess of course we should, how we can shorten that timeline? I guess we had the right panel go before us. Um, it's really just the, the automation process of collecting and processing the data. Um, sail drone, bedrock, tear depth, they're, they're kind of already doing it and, and perfect examples of, uh, there's robots out there these days that can literally do everything and anything. Um, taking advantage of those, collecting the data with those and being able to process it and upload it to, to cloud-based servers is, is huge. Um, we're, we're starting to see it in almost every industry. Um, so just uh, continuing down that path and I think it's gonna really reduce that time. Mm -hmm. Just speaking from Telen and Keras, building automation into all of our workflows and making it accessible through Python APIs and different, uh, you know, different tools. And we're currently retooling to make everything uh, in our applications, you know, working towards that idea of cloud native and being able to, you know, containerize architecture so that it'll be easily deployable in the cloud or on networks uh, as the workforce is changing. So being able to recognize that you know, what are the tools that are needed and making sure that we're building in the appropriate automation and the appropriate technology, you know, to support those changes in the industry um, as it is. Automation is very important, but what people, and I agree completely with that, but um, people need to know what they need to do in order to get the data ready to be um, uploaded or um, given, submitted, for example, to the archives. So very, um, very precise or clear in information and instructions are also very helpful. That shortens the life cycle. So there's no ambiguity into what is what what we need from you and what you need from us. So keeping that communication is open and also making sure that whatever our best practices are, our requirements, for example, data needs to be open. It needs to be, um, there's, we can't really archive and make accessible something that is restricted. So those kind of agreements. So making sure there's a submission agreement that we work with a data provider that makes those makes us both understand what we need from each other also helps. But then again, um, for example, the work that um, is being done in Colorado with some of the with the excuse me the bathymetry is really going through and doing upgrades to how the data has been ingested as um, as are some of our systems age off, then how do we you know, start moving things um, to the cloud? How do we make things um, do continuous improvements on the projects we have or things that work um, that are making the time from the time the data gets submitted to us? Because we don't necessarily always do the acquisition, but we get the acquisitions and then we make them accessible. So that's also been something that's really important. Communication is really important along with the automation. I, I love the communication thing because it's such a human part of this very, very technical field that we're in. And we have had some great experiences very recently, um, sanctuaries working with NCEI that really resulted from just picking up the phone. So communication, the, the human element is still important. <laughs> Hopefully will be for a few more hundred years. Lyndon. In, in addition to automation, I would just like to um, hit on simplification. Um, because for me, the less buttons I have to press, the better it is. I'm, my background is not actually in data processing. I have since learned, 
but the less interaction I have to do with the processing, the less I have time I have to spend on it. And I know um, I'm not the only one who has other things to do. Um, and we are also a small organization and there we're not the only small organization out there. So more products like Teradeps and Bedrocks, which is like instantaneous, mm -hmm. things like that, continuing down that road um, would help someone like me or smaller organizations um, a lot in the future, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mary Claire, do you have some um, input on the timeline and how we can shorten it? Or did you already answer that? I, um, I guess it was kind of fused with my last answer. And I think that the other panelists um, sort of hit the nail on the head with just making it, you know, usable and, and, and as easy as possible to go from sort of collection to application. So, yeah. The next um, question to you, and as we know, and we've talked about today, there there really is a wealth of information um, expertise uh, in Indigenous communities. And what would be your advice, uh, experience in how we can work better and um, share capacities better with those communities? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, it's it's been a it's kind of an interesting interface that I work at, and um, I was thinking about you know when we think about the Great Lakes community at large, and we're such a huge um, huge community of scientists and researchers, and we all care so much about the Great Lakes, and I think uh, our societies as a whole are beginning to acknowledge the original caretakers of of the land and the wealth of knowledge that's there. Um, some of the things that we forget as researchers um, that I think help us think about, move, you know, a shared path forward and working together is really just acknowledging that all research we do within the Great Lakes Basin is uh, within Indigenous Nations territories. And um, I see, you know, as we move forward as researchers and decision makers that we have a collective responsibility to sort of reconsider how we approach our work within these lakes and, and watersheds. Um, and we need to start reaching out, like do our homework and, and really understand, okay, whose territory am I on? Who, who has a relationship with these lands and waters? And then reach out to them and, and say, hey, I'm, I'm a researcher. I'm interested in working in, in, your, um, in your area or in your territory. And let them know what you're doing and, and maybe consider asking them, you know, if, if there's anything that you're creating that could be helpful to them, or if there's any tweaks that would be to your own studies that would help answer some questions they might have. Sometimes you won't even get a response, but you know, taking um, that role, that uh, role of consulting and in Canada, we call it sort of the duty to consult and, um, and I think that that's really important for us to start thinking about. It was funny in one of our, I was on the committee for the Smart Great Lakes um, initiative and I, I sort of brought this up and uh, one of the other committee members said, it's kind of like, you know, if someone wanted to put a weather station in my backyard and didn't even acknowledge that it was my backyard and didn't tell me what it was for or even ask if they could do that. And so we start thinking about it in that context, really respecting their rights to those spaces and, and their history with those lands and waters is important sort of foundation for beginning to work together. Um, and then sort of extending uh, beyond that, um, you know, as we start to build relationships that gets us launched. Um, and then we have to start thinking about knowledge equity. So oftentimes as Western scientists, we've been trained that that is the sort of way we validate the world and come to know things. And if you wanna work with indigenous communities, you need to look at indigenous systems of knowledge as, uh, as equal so not use western science to validate it or just sprinkle a little indigenous knowledge into your work but actually bring them together in an, in an equitable way and there's lots of really cool frameworks and and researchers that have started to to do that um and in our bamaj project that's what we strive to do a lot of our um the design of our work is shaped by the community's knowledge and how we interpret our 
our um, findings from both community knowledge and the um, technology we use is sort of all brought to the table. And we're not using one to validate the other, but to explore understanding that space as a whole. Um, and so that's something that I kind of wanted to sort of flag is if, if, if we want to engage with indigenous communities or nations around the Great Lakes, we need to respect their system of knowledge as equally valid to the ones that we've been, been trained in as, as Western scientists. Um, so I'll leave that there because I kind of went on a bit of a tangent. Thank you. <laughs> I, it was very good, though. I like um, the simple statements that it's just valuing them equally, not just sprinkling in um, uh, to check a box. Uh, so very good points. Um, anyone else input on on in, engaging with Indigenous communities? Nazi and I, we had a good conversation, a short one earlier, and I liked some of your word choice about, <laughs> about the language though. And, um, and I'm not sure if that was where you were going, but like the inclusivity and thinking more about what, how, what we call things so, so it's more accessible. Yeah, so we, um, I, the first time I had heard, and we've all heard of FAIR, right? FAIR. Um, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible, which is a very Western way of looking at data and data reproducibility and the importance of making sure data is available. And then last, I think it was in J January of this year, I went to the Earth Sciences Information Partners um, winter meeting, and it was the first time I heard about CARE, which is the I guess it's not, it's just it's a complementary way of looking at things, and it's used mostly by Indigenous and native communities. So looking at, you know, really looking at it, um, data from, a, I wanna say more of a holistic point of view. So making sure that you understand the authoritativeness, understanding the ethics behind it, uh, making, understanding the responsibility of having this data. And, um, and it, part of that is actually understanding the words and how things are described. And I think we spend a lot of time when we're doing, for example, creating metadata or um, ways of looking at search to get data, making it accessible. Um, we don't take into account others' words for, um, and I think that's that's becoming more and more apparent and it is more, um, maybe with the crowdsource data, not so much with our authoritative data sets, but when we're, when we're gathering data from um, other sources um, into things like crowdsource bathymetry that we start thinking a little bit more about how other um, groups may be describing their holdings or their data, um, whether it's using a place name that's different than what, you know, what we've been using um, in the past. And I think, for example, one of our um, data scientists we just hired is really looking at semantic data searches. So some natural like language processing, but then really thinking about how to use and um, be able to be more inclusive in the, in the words that are used for data searching. Okay, Thanks. so back to um, community being very key and integral. Yeah, we've spent a lot of time, I think, talking about inclusivity when it comes to data, and I don't think we're doing, I think we're doing a better job, but I think that's like one of the grand challenges mm -hmm. to some of the work that we're gonna be doing as we go on forward. So speaking of moving forward and with all of the, the ways we have to uh, acquire data, um, how do you, how can we ensure, and also talking about equitable access, how can we, what would be good next steps or, or, or you know, how can we ensure this as we move forward in the future that we're ensuring this equitable access? That's kind of a big, hard question, I guess, building upon what we have said. <laughs> Well, I'm gonna just put one comment on there and it kind of builds on something Nazi mentioned earlier where she was kind of talking about like open formats. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the like roles we've talked a little bit, I think it was the first panel this morning, you know, talking about the role of government and, you know, where is their part and our part and private industry's part. And again, making sure that we build standards and formats and that everyone contributes. That's something that Keras also investigates and invests in making sure that, for example, BAG and all of the new S100 work, we wanna make sure that we're attending all those meetings in addition to the government partners that are developing the work so that other private softwares can support 
and um, make sure that we can allow, uh, you know, all of the different groups to have access to those formats and standards. And by having a common framework of standards and formats, that's what will allow, you know, projects like this to thrive because you have to have that interoperative language of a standard or a format that's well described that will fit and uh, work within a project. So that's uh, kind of one of those foundational elements is making sure you have the right tools uh, to build that foundation and that framework. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a challenge that we're, we're kind of seeing, and I don't know if there's a proper way that we've <laughs> developed to overcome it yet. Um, but yeah, the, the standards issue, I think we see it across the board. Um, you see the, the battle between industry and, and government organizations and what's the, the best approach there. Mm -hmm. Not too sure. I think uh, companies like Teradep and, and Bedrock and I believe Gloss is coming up with something. Uh, yeah, Siegel. Um, maybe a cloud cloud-based um, mm -hmm. platform to, to access it and provide access to everybody. Um, but you're still going to encounter what formats do we, do we have, what, what becomes the standard, what becomes the norm. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, we're going to get there anytime soon. Um, it's something that you're going to constantly see uh, because there's benefits and arguments to, to each side when you're looking at it, um, and they're always going to play their their role. Um, so I think it's going to be something that uh, will will slowly progress as we uh, we move forward. Continue to work towards Linda. Um, well, I can speak to a little bit more on Seagull since you gave me that great segue there. <laughs> Um, well, our big thing is discoverability, um, and we are building in search, search fun functionality um, that, so that when the great map is created and it's open and it's available and we have a comprehensive surface of the Great Lakes and it's a web service, that people can search for something like a shipwreck and they get the bathymetric layers, or they search for something like sinkhole, or maybe they are interested in hydrographic data or hydro dynamic modeling, and they could still potentially pull up the bathymetric layers. We aren't necessarily going to be hosting those layers. Um, NCI already exists, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel there. But people could be potentially clicking on the great map, and depending on where they click, they could get um, bounced out or re, forgetting the word, but you know what I'm talking about. They can get moved on to potentially NCEI or um, the NONA 10 or CH, um, CHS data sets and download them there. Mm -hmm. um, but if they don't want to have to deal with potentially the raw data or download the data, they can use the great map itself um, as a source if for whatever they may need, whether that's looking at a shipwreck or doing some modeling on their own. I think discoverability is, is huge because the majority of the users, and we hope, are not gonna wanna look at the raw data. So they might, we might have all the coffee shops mapped, but we need to have different words for coffee really is the discoverability. And um, I, I, Mary Claire had the great point that accessibility, um, and I'll bat it to you after, after this Mary Claire, but it, we don't just talk about, or we shouldn't just talk about accessibility at the end, right? You need to involve and be inclusive through the life cycle of the data. Thoughts on that, Mary Claire, and, and how we proceed to the future with um, ensuring um, accessibility. That's, we have to guarantee it. Sorry to use that strong word, we're gonna ensure it, but we're gonna try like Brendan was saying. Yeah, I think, I think yeah, just sort of revisiting that full life cycle and thinking about, you know, when I think about the great map, even, um, you know, with the communities that I'm working with and, and our contributions to that, like having Lyndon come and, and tr you know, spend a, an afternoon giving a workshop on, on what it is and how to access it and, and how to click you, where you live and, and bring that up, you know, and, and really making sure that after all these efforts that there's that um, sort of dissemination back to the contributing communities or people where or different groups or organizations that are gonna benefit from these initiatives or that we hope will benefit from these initiatives so that that dissemination piece is gonna be key at the end, but also then getting them to contribute and see the value at the beginning is, is you, know, you have to go full circle. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that plays a big role in equitable access. And, and then just like, again, reminding ourselves, what are we doing this for? Who, who benefits and who maybe is being left behind or who doesn't, isn't, doesn't even have a seat at the table to benefit from this? And how do we sort of um, shrink that gap? <clears throat> Wonderful. 
So we've, we've talked a bit about everything from acquisition, maybe a little light on acquisition in this one. Sorry, <laughs> Brendan and Tammy. <laughs> but um, the accessibility, I, I was happy that we focused on that. Um, if you guys don't have anything else to add at this time, we can open it up for questions from the audience and from the virtual audience. I have one from the virtual audience. The question is, is it possible to honor data sovereignty while striving for data equity and open data, or are they opposites? Good one. I, I could chime in a little bit there. It's, it's been alluded to a couple of times today when we talk about metadata and appropriately assigning the correct metadata when you, you know, set up that estate planning, you're going to set up, you know, what is this data? How are the appropriate uses that need to be applied to that data? So you, you set up the appropriate metadata and then it comes down to resolution as well. That was mentioned in one of the earlier panels that, you know what, maybe there are various, you know, products available and, you know, high, medium and low resolution. And those metadata sets might be different based on the resolution and the scale of the products available. So again, it's making sure you set it up and you build a great estate of data and then you're able to make it accessible to who it's allowed to be accessible to. And that's all a part of making it uh, a good system. <laughs> and don't forget, for example, um, digital object identifiers give attribution back. So that data, that it follows your data. So um, it's, if you archive your data in CI, you'll get a DOI and that's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the same idea that I mentioned earlier of being able to click on the data and getting redirected to that data source, um, maintain sovereignty as well as, you know, collecting the metadata if you're not interested in actually, if you just wanna see who collected it, that should come up and you should be able to see it there as well. We have more questions from the audience here. Oh, yes. Assuming findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data is achieved, how do you see data quality being addressed? question <laughs> that goes if you want to go first I always have an answer for everything but, <laughs> <laughs> I mean uh, that's one of the things when we start to build systems I, I like to right. talk about building systems because that's what bedrock has achieved that's what all of these other groups are working to achieve and that's hopefully something that you're building into your system with automation you, you can't build a successful system without also thinking of data quality and making sure that you find ways to build in checks, balances, mm -hmm. and validation into your system. So uh, I think that's just part of what we need to do as, you know, responsible software providers and things like that, that it's, it, that's one of the onuses that's on us. Mm -hmm. Talk about, you know, what's the government's job and what's our job is, you know, when we provide the tools for you to process, acquire, and distribute your data, we need to make sure that we're providing ways for you to validate in an automated fashion as well. So that's, that's our responsibility mm -hmm. as I see it. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have the, the platforms too that offer the different tiers of quality. So you're going to have battery data, you're going to have laser data, you're going to have SAS, you're going to have all those different tiers too, it, it, the same area that you're looking at. So um, it, how they go about that and disseminating that and is there access to everybody for different tiers? Who knows, but um, that's kind of the plan too. Nazi, were you I was I was thinking of two things. One is that um, if you build a tool for somebody to do data acquisition and does some sort of makes it easier to make sure the quality is better because there may be some like checks and balances along the way. And um, so some of the tools that NCI has built, for example, for things like cruise packs. So it's not necessarily the data gets acquired. It's that's not necessarily where the problem may lie. It may be actually in the packaging of the data. So if you have one standard way that you give scientists who's not necessarily going to, not necessarily a data manager to be able to like pack and play their data and send it off to NCI, that might reduce a, the amount of time it takes, but also um, maybe catch things before they um, fall apart. Things like um, I use with their um, with their more observational data, you know, coming up with these like standards, like Quartog standards, and making sure that there's um, there's this level of checking for quality assurance, which is important, I think. At NCI, 
we do work on these things when we work through and build data streams. Also for other kinds of data sets, we actually have subject matter experts who do look at the data prior to getting archived. Sometimes things get kicked back, but I mean, most of the, uh, the symmetry data is not, that's not a problem, but other kinds of data sets, we hit, that's where you engage in conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I love to, whenever we talk metadata, data is not complete without metadata. And one of the like things of metadata that's important is how good is this data, both, you know, and one of the ways that hydrographers like to talk about it is horizontal and vertical uncertainty. So it's not good enough anymore to say, hey, here's my data point. It needs to be the expectation nowadays that, oh yeah, and this is how good it is. Because if we're gonna archive it in a data set, we're gonna wanna know how we can use that data in the future. And if you don't say this is the data point, oh yeah, and it's accurate within you know half a meter or half a foot. If you don't provide that additional piece of metadata to that data point, then you won't be able to use it down the road in the way that you might want to for hydrodynamic modeling, for example. You know, it might be good enough for a habitat study, but it won't necessarily be good for you know modeling or for floodwater control work. So again, making sure that you continue to think about you know validation data quality alongside that data point. We need to think about that throughout the entire workflow as well. Mm -hmm. Mary Claire, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think that was very thorough. <laughs> I just didn't want to leave you out. Thanks. <laughs> You're in the nether world. Yeah, so that speaks to, um, Tammy, what you were just saying, uh, that every ping matters, and we know where to put it and how it matters with that important necessary metadata. Any other questions? Give you uh, my panel uh, the opportunity to to say add anything more say anything to our guests here uh, i think shelby has another oh, question actually. sorry shelby <laughs> no i was a little slow i was trying to give the room a chance um <laughs> so i don't have to keep reading but i'm happy to do it how do you see data or i guess it's, yeah how do you see data temporality when new data comes in do you see possible time series extractions with older data Does that make sense, anyone? I, I just, just I, 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 I dabble in NOAA a lot. When you start with NOAA, you always have a heart for NOAA. But I know that for NOAA, for example, they have like a decaying score where, you know, you don't necessarily take the data out, but it can reduce a score that says, hey, how good is this data? You know, maybe we want to like reduce the quality of that score, you know, over time. So I think that we've established as a community, we don't necessarily want to take data off the chart because we've all kind of come to an agreement as a community that some data is better than no data. So you don't wanna you know, just take it away when it's expired or old, but maybe reducing that quality element to say, hey, okay, this is getting old. Mm. But that's a, a really you know, good way that's been put out there as this is maybe a, an idea of how to handle that. That answers that pretty directly, I would say. And thank you for that, because the question sort of threw me. <laughs> so <laughs> wonderful. Shelby, any more? Okay, wonderful. Well, this has been um, very enlightening. And as the title of the panel said, I think it has been illuminating. Thank you all very much for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us here this afternoon. Um, and thank you to the audience. A warm round of applause for our panelists. And I'll hand it back over to our fearless leader. <laughs> <laughs> He's a thirsty one. I can say that. All right. Well, you guys just stay right there. <clears throat> uh, I am the only thing standing between you and the Rock Bottom Brewery, so I'm going to keep this brief. Uh, John Robinson is our host tonight. It's at the Rock Bottom Brewery. Everybody here is welcome, along with anybody you meet along the way. One, no, just kidding. One West Grand Avenue. So it is on the bottom of the agenda. It's also on the back with our seagull themed map, compliments of Dig, thank you very much. They did a phenomenal job with our graphics. Um, anyway, so it's just, uh, it's basically due west of us and a little more. Uh, so I invite you all tonight. There will be other people there. There will be non bathymetry people there. So be prepared for that, but they're still water people. So it's okay. Uh, John invited them and since he's paying for it, it's super okay. Uh, anyway, so I think there will be an opportunity, I don't know where Katie is, but uh, 
if people want to say a few words, I think you're welcome to. I think John's going to say a few words. He was hoping to do that tonight, but he had to dash away. So uh, we'll have we'll have stuff there. I think there's drinks. I think there's food. I think there's going to be some networking. And uh, I think it starts at 5.30. So let's go. We're breaking a little bit early, which is unheard of <laughs> for me. <laughs> Thank you very much for a really great day. We couldn't be happier with how it turned out. It was phenomenal. Really appreciate all of your attendance and participation. So thank you very much.